Good morning, you happy little otters. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> happy Saturday gaming is here. Welcome to the Weekender. Mm. Um, uh, I am Warren, and this morning I'm joined by Jerry and Lloydy and Ben. We are missing the bald one. But that's okay. It means it's going to be a great episode. <laughs> I've been told that he's actually found a way to eat something that isn't chips. I, so that's do you know what? Really big, I, so. I have heard this as well. I have mm -hmm. I have resisted the temptation to torture my little friend <laughs> while he's been on holiday. It's very decent of you. Like I mean, <laughs> I mean, I have resisted beyond anything. He he, uh, I was pretty sure that he was texting around just to see if I was still alive. I have resisted so well. <laughs> <laughs> However, I did hear mm. that he, he muttered the immortal words of, I eat Chinese now. Yeah, I was just saying that my missus, she's like, oh, Justin's gone to a Spanish island and discovered Asian food. <laughs> <laughs> it's very harsh, but fair. But I, this, feel, yeah. but I love this. I love this because, you know, you know that Justin's going to come back Okay, with a wee spring in his step. Justin has this uh, this unbelievable tick mm. that whenever he's like a puppy, whenever he does something that he's particularly proud of, he has a little shimmy and a little jump that he does in his walk. Right, he will walk through into the into the studios mm. with that little shimmy and that walk, and he will declare, <laughs> "I eat Chinese now." <laughs> <laughs> At which point. I'm going to take him and make him eat some real Chinese. <laughs> that's, that's very harsh, I feel. Now, for anybody watching who doesn't realize how epic this is, yes. we once went to London for some event. Yes. And Warren had taken us all down to a Korean barbecue. Yes, mm. now a Korean barbecue. Justin is a meat eater, right? You think that would be amazeball? You, you would have, I, I would have thought Korean barbecue, Justin would be right in these yeah. elements. Yeah. So I took him and we went to a Korean barbecue and I thought this is going to be amazing. <laughs> and Justin, Justin is is looking around him, and he's like some sort of like scared puppy, you know. And it just the, the eyes stand in his head, looking around him. Oh, there's strange people here. There's strange food going on. Everything's weird. There's nothing. This doesn't look like a Northern Irish chippy. I don't smell gravy. I can't see any chips. <laughs> so he's looking around him in in a sheer panic, right? And then the the lady. Uh, is is looking over and starts to walk our direction with a plate full of raw meat because we're going to cook it in front of ourselves yeah. on, the, on the barbecue. And uh, Justin says, oh, lovely, can't wait. I'm just going to go to the toilet. An hour later, <laughs> Justin comes comes back in. I say, you all right? Oh, no, I'm just not feeling very well, man. I'm just not feeling very well. <laughs> Meanwhile, we had ate all the meat, and I said, "I'm really sorry, man. We we waited for you, but you know this needed cooked, and we, and we ate it up." Oh no, it's okay. I wouldn't have eaten anyway because it just it came on me all of a sudden. The sod had walked out of the restaurant and <laughs> walked half of London to go to a McDonald's, and then walked back and came in <laughs> and didn't let on that he had went to Mickey D's. Oh dear, this is the this is the boy. This is the boy that we had in Warhammer World, mm. okay? And we were very fortunate to be in the canteen, not the not Bugman's, but we're yeah. actually in there, the staff canteen, yeah, yeah. Um, getting a, a, a meal. And um, there's people queuing up, and all you can hear from Justin from the other side of the room is shouting at the chefs, No veg! No veg! <laughs> <laughs> it's not yellow he won't eat as, it as they were plating up his days he's like no veg no veg panicking literally just no veg people from Northern Ireland are very good at giving the negatives <laughs> so we're, uh, the fact that he now eats Chinese food I think is an absolute delight I so. imagine he still picks the big bits of you know, vegetables, so all of the chunks of peppers and stuff hey, get left to one dude, side of the table. When I get him sat down to a plate of salt and chili squid, this is going to be amazing. So. Make, it makes our <laughs> life a lot easier, though. Yeah. Oh, yes. We can continue can, on the journey of yeah, fat men. He can, <laughs> he, can, he can now eat traditional Northern Ireland cuisine. Traditional Northern Irish cuisine. That is true. <laughs> And um, yeah, this is a show about gaming. <laughs> but we're just we're just happy to wrap it on and gossip about our buddy Justin. <laughs> right next week, kicking off on Monday, we have Firelock Week. Wow, we are deep diving into all the games that the creators of South Park love to play. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna have loads of Let's Plays. We're gonna have a Let's Play of Blood and Plunder. Yep, Let's Pirates. Play Oak and Iron. 
Pirate ships. Let's play of Blood and Valor. Pirate World War One. Pirate World War One. Yeah. <laughs> there in it. There's a certain pirate theme. Anyway. Yeah. But, I believe yeah. we have like a, a a video describing what's coming up and in the future and stuff like that. Because yeah. I know people yeah, are crying out for more information about Blood and Blood, uh, Blood and Valor and Blood stuff. Blood and Valor. Yeah. So it's it's going to be interesting because it's taking the core of the system uh, that they came up with for Blood and Plunder and then reworking it so it's not a straight reskin for World War One. They've changed core mechanics that yeah. changed how initiative works um, to make it more interesting and to give a better representation of World War One combat and it's it's still the fast play skirmish aspect so you're not mm-hmm. looking at units standing in trench lines facing another unit standing in a trench line there it's all about the the skirmish aspect of the game um but it's 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 very interesting I'll give it that it's cool yeah, it's, and, we're, yeah. and we're gonna have three copies of the Oak and Iron core set to give away Nice. So you can win them by commenting on YouTube. You nice. can win them by commenting on tabletop.com. Uh-huh. And if you're a Cult of Games member and you comment, you get an extra chance to win. Mm. And if you're a Cult of Games member, just remember, you get to join our Discord, which is turning out to be one of the coolest things we have ever done in our lives. That's why the cool kids call it Disco. Oh, it's <laughs> so, it is so much fun. Uh, it's, uh, I have never, ever felt closer to the cult of games communities than than what we do we do now. So um, if you are a member um, and you haven't tried it out yet, pop in from time to time because it's it's just it's just lovely. It is really just lovely. And if you haven't, or if you've been a, a been a backstage member previously and you you fancy coming back and helping the whole thing continue to run and becoming a cultist, you could become a cultist. You get to join a secret society, man. <laughs> this is this is. I have been deep delving into secret societies um, all, 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 in a big, big way, mm. okay? This is like a dream come true for me, okay? This is this is like us as gamers getting to establish our own church. We could end up not paying taxes here. This is, <laughs> <laughs> There's so much possibilities yeah. to this. There you go. There's so the, many happens. There is the end goal revealed. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you want to join, if you want to join our cult, okay, because remember, this this could not work without the cult. We can't, we can't continue to do this if we don't have the cult, okay? Um, so if you want to join the cult, keep it going, <laughs> and most importantly of all, join a secret society. Everybody's wanted to do it. Yeah, okay. but not any secret society, obviously. Just just ours. Yeah. Yeah, you only <laughs> want to join our secret society. Billion year contracts and all are sitting ready for <laughs> ready for signing. But um here's a, here's an interesting one for you, mm. right? So I have every Friday the cult the cult um communique goes out. The newsletter, Cogito Ludus goes out. And it's got um I've been priming 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 the 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 cult of games community Mm -hmm. in the way of cracking ciphers and things like that so there's a code goes out every friday okay and some people are getting if i may say so shit hot at cracking these Mm -hmm. codes like i mean they are getting very very good at it so much so i have ideas for community treasure hunts and stuff that are that are coming up but in my research of what makes secret societies and cults special, okay? Hmm. It's all about having something bigger than all of the membership combined. And it can't just be me. <laughs> well, I don't know, we've got Zary, he's like 6'6". Six, six. He's, he's like 6'7". Six, six, he's, he's only one six off. <laughs> <laughs> Still fairly certain Rasmus is bigger. <clears throat> so what uh, what it is is all about, uh, about the core purpose of what the secret society is all about. What in the world is it manipulating? And we have that. Yes. But you have to be a cultist to find out what it is. And a lot of occultists won't know what it is yet, but you will. That's not just to do with Lloyd baking dice at 180 degrees to get them to come up with good numbers. <sighs> Those desert rat dice, they're amazing. Public service announcement. <laughs> How the hell does this whole baking dice thing work? So do you put the six to the top or the six to the bottom? Oh, yeah. You put the, uh, the six to the top. Right. So, so What's the on end? the opposite side of a six? A one. 
one. Okay. So you put the one to the bottom. Yeah. You bake your dice. You bake your dice at what temperature? 180 degrees. So gas mark six, yes? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> the, the insides, like everything, you know, the insides start to melt and do you, down. Do you preheat the oven? Oh, yeah. You have to preheat your oven. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, so you don't want to put in your dice in a cold oven. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. So you preheat your it's like oven. A pavlova. One's face down, okay, and you, you bake these dice for how long? Oh, about 20 to 30 minutes. How long do you do them for? <laughs> how long do you do them for? <laughs> I need to know. <laughs> need to know. <laughs> and then what, what, what we're saying is, is basically the, 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 the chemical, the, uh, the, the, the structure of the dice starts to weigh down towards the one yeah, to the, make it more likely to settle. The, like. no, yeah, the, the inside settles. Mm. The good thing is if you live in a hot climate, yep. you can just throw them out on the tarmac oh, that's true. Oh, right. or just, a bit of pavement and just yeah. let the sun naturally bake them. <laughs> set, set them on a bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like sun-dried tomatoes. It's better. <laughs> Or if it's but, natural, yeah. yeah. Oh dear! And that way, naturally, having you go, I yeah, didn't do anything. No, no, no. Uh -huh. Just, Just left them in the window so. <laughs> you know, guys, you know, how many people are triggered out there? <laughs> They're telling people to pick their dice. Oh, cheating! They're cheating. Look, we would never ever condone, condone cheating, um, other than dice baking, right? So Firelock <laughs> Games Week kicks off on Monday. It's going to be a lot of fun, as Lordy says. We have a lot of prizes. Some of those prizes are exclusive to the Cult of Games members, but the big prize for any Cult of Games member is is the community they join yeah. on the Discord. It but, is but it's you just can brilliant, you so. can nip in free for thirty days. Yes, yes, you can nip in free. So for even for days. next week's prizes, you could nip in, become a cultist. If it's only for thirty days, so be it. You still get the chance to comment. We mm. promise not to hunt you down if you cancel after thirty days and, and bugger <laughs> off. We we do. We promise not to come and find out where you live and drag you into our sanctuary and make you sign up again. That's Pinky it. promise. <laughs> ben isn't really in a room. He's in the sanctuary. We just sort of chained him in there. If you've ever seen the episode that Ben that Ben did from the basement. <laughs> oh, we got to get you back in there, man. It was epic. Right. I don't. It was so cold down there. I don't want to go home. <laughs> okay, next one. We have a game Ooh. in the studio. Um, uh, we have a game. Uh, what? We do have a game. We yes. do have a game. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, no, Fog and Friction. Mm. Because of the, the alliteration of it, mm. I apologize, but I keep calling it Frog and Friction. So, it, But it's Fog and Friction. Yeah. It's a World War II card game. Now, myself and Jerry have had a chance to have yeah. a play at this. Um, it's still, um, uh, we, we would consider this still first impressions, hmm. but so far I have really enjoyed our playthroughs that we've, yeah. that we've had so far. Do you want to, do you yeah. want to crack her open and give us a, give us a bit of your, your insight? Well, the, the name, if people are fans of historic, well, not just historic gaming, but warfare in general, mm -hmm. um, Prussian general, von Clausewitz. Carl, the, he wrote a book on war. Right. And he referred to everything being, as far as strategy is concerned, everything in war comes down to fog and friction, the unexpected and the um, unknown or something like that. So that's yeah. that's where the title comes from. Oh, cool. So which way, things like fog of war and stuff like that yeah. all come from his book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because it's a card building game. So Deck builder. Deck builder. Mm -hmm. um, so you get three decks in here and we played with this one um, during our little play tests, which we shouldn't have. We should have played with this one and this one, and these are your additional. But right. it still gives us the idea of how it plays. Yeah. Essentially, you build a 60-card deck. So these are those are the allies. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea behind it is, we'll get back to the blank ones in a second. Mm -hmm. You play for battlefields. So... You, uh, There's can, cards with battlefields on yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. So. you construct a, um, in fact, there's one of our battlefields there. You construct a deck uh, in two parts. Essentially, you get a battlefield set, which set to one side. So you can have up to five battlefields. And battlefields can be rural, as you can see from the little tuft of grass. Mm -hmm. Or, who are you? There'll be another rural, uh, some sort of forested area. Yeah, there's or rural forests. Urban. Urban, yeah. yeah. Um, so you would build a deck of an army that is fit to go for the battlefields that you have picked. Mm -hmm. So you have your five battlefields, your opponent has your five, has their five battlefields and they have armies based in there. And the cards are based into frontline troops who have got these lovely red ribbons on them. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, the Allied is both American and um, British. 
And after your red front line cards, mm -hmm. you also get um, purple support cards and green reinforcement cards. So uh, if I find some of the green ones. Yeah. Ah, so blue. it's more of a blue they're, they're, than a purple. Uh, yeah. Okay, so sure. blue support. What, blue. What's those purple ones there then? These are the fog and friction cards themselves. So they're played on the battlefield. So, in, for example, this one, adapt and overcome all friendly Sherman cards deployed to this battlefield gain plus one armor damage and plus one infantry damage. Right. So those are played on the battlefield and will either be uh, immediately played and discarded or will sit on the battlefield for a while. Right. Um, and then these green ones are your reinforcements so so the what you want to call purple blue that, yeah it doesn't look blue to me but anyway <laughs> um so these blue and green cards are support cards so they yeah. sit behind your front line and they can be things like um red cross parcels or air power or artillery or additional reinforcements brought in on night maneuvers or that sort of thing yeah um so the basics of how this worked as we yeah. played it anyway you had you we we, we had two battlefields. You played two battlefields simultaneously, yes. And then um, we had a deck that we had built, yep. shuffled, dealt ourselves some cards, and then you deploy your frontline troops. Yes. And then behind the frontline troops, then you're able to then deploy the support. Um, yeah. And support is interesting because support can be quite, um, it can be, you know, assaulty or defensively uh, defensive. Like I, I had things yeah. like a like a yeah, tank line, tank, tank and, traps, and, and stuff camouflage like that. Yeah. and stuff like that. It was really, really interesting. Like there's no dice rolling or anything in this. No. It's uh, <clears throat> there's a lovely depth. I think as you as you start to unlock this, there's a, there's a real nice depth to the strategy. Yeah. In this, especially the fact that you're you're fighting over two battlefields. Yes. And the idea is to if you. If your opponent at the end of a round doesn't have any frontline troops at that battlefield, if if they don't have any, I want to say if they don't have any, yeah, let's go with they don't have any frontline troops because yeah. if a can you see these here or are they too far away? Well, they're too far away. So that's our battlefield. This is our front line. Your front line is a unit is a line of three. You don't need to worry about what's on them. But then your back line are support. Yeah. If this front line trip gets removed from play, uh -huh. then it's supporting backline trip also gets removed yeah so that just leaves you with two front this is line. very difficult so to see you, you don't yeah. you don't need to see you just need to look at the rows all right the if rows. the front line goes yeah. the support behind it goes uh -huh. so regardless of what it is unless it specifically says with so some air uh power so some airplanes will stay even if they don't have frontline support right but essentially you need to remove your opponent's front line mm -hmm. to remove the back line yeah however as we played and we discovered the back line had so many negative modifiers, so the camouflage, the mm -hmm. tank traps. I couldn't do damage to the front line without first removing the back line. Yes. And that's where the tactics in your deck building come in. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't deal with the support units, then you can't deal with the front line units. Correct. And it's those synergies between them that really pay off. And then you have things where you can throw these fog and friction cards that can be um, permanent changes to the battlefield like yeah. your opponent doesn't have enough um, fuel to keep going or they can be quick direct damage things like uh, an artillery bombardment or a big gun coming in or whatever mm -hmm. something that deals damage quickly and you can use it to uh, stimmy your opponent's attack or to give you a bump before you go in to attack yourself so th there's a lot a lot to be done with them because the the basic set comes with two 50 card decks plus the the center deck which is like another 20 cards or so so you've got 70-ish cards aside but you only ever build a deck to 60. Yes. So you've got options where you can flip in and flip out what you're going to do and I presumably then the expansions will also give you other cards then that you can go okay well this battlefield is very urban infantry and this artillery work very well rural so i don't want to use those but mm -hmm. these things work better in an urban environment and you get bonuses for it so you can tailor your forces to the battlefields you want to fight on yeah now you might not get to fight on those battlefields if you're particularly bad and your opponent steamrolls you then he's <laughs> picking his battlefields from his deck that's right yeah which means he's he's um directing the the pace of the battle and 
picking the battlefields he wants to fight on that he's more suited to. That's cool because that, yeah. re that represents very well that if you're the winning <laughs> faction, you're the one who's picking you're, where the battles are happening. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you're uh, dictating the pace of the battle as well and where things are being fought over. So it's it's very interesting that you've got this. You're not playing on one battlefield, you play on two simultaneously. Um, so you might get into a position where, yes, you can go forward and take a battlefield, um, but you might be very hampered on the other one mm -hmm. because you just you, you don't have the equipment in your hand to, to crack that nut, essentially. There's an interesting thing in the mechanic of how, um, how you actually defeat a mm. unit as yep. well. So um, a unit, for example, there might be a tank unit in there, Lloyd, that has um, two tank symbols on it, okay? Yeah. Which means you have to do... In fact, here we go. There you go. So you have to do two damage to that tank uh, that tank unit Yeah. to put it in... There's two states, Jerry. Yeah. So the first state that it goes into is... So it starts at full strength yep. and they'll start vertically. Mm -hmm. And then once this has taken two points of damage, they then become depleted so, yeah. and, and, they get, the card. and they get tapped like yeah. in magic. Mm -hmm. Now, if we had both of these out and they're both tank symbols, your opponent needs two to deplete this and one to deplete this you can't deplete a weaker unit first you have to always start there's a a, a priority so yeah the higher strength need to be depleted first so he would get depleted if you'd cause two damage mm -hmm. and then if you cause another one damage he'd get depleted and if you had caused just one damage then nothing would happen because it wouldn't well would it uh, you pick the highest one you can so in this case because they're only one, you can't touch him, uh -huh. so you would deplete oh, this. Oh, but you can deplete the other yeah. one. Right. Yeah. Now, when they're depleted, Lloyd, that means that um, using reinforcements, you can undeplete them and bring them back into play. You can bring play. them back, yeah. There might be other mechanics in there for doing that as well. But if so if I rolled a two, okay, I, could deplete, I would deplete the big one, mm. okay? In the next round, say nothing else had changed, okay, if I rolled another two... Mm -hmm. I would have to yeah. deplete the weaker one before I could do any additional damage yeah. to any of the so, others. Yeah. So you would then deplete, you'd bring this unit down from full strength. So your brain gun carriers would go from full strength to depleted. Mm -hmm. And then because you've got one point of damage left, it would then destroy the brain gun carriers, which means the M36s are still there and could be reinforced. Yeah. If you want to get rid of those, you would need to do another two you points, or you need to do two points of damage right off the bat. So for that, you need to do two to deplete it, and then a further two to get through whatever it might be there mm. to to yeah. to actually destroy it and remove it. And this is where your so, support comes in because your support is is you've got potentially got a loaded negative. And modifiers. you work on the back lines first. <laughs> you choose. So if no, if mean, your if your back line is your back line is support, so it could be tank traps or it could be a infantry night convoy where they're bringing extra people forward and you can go well i'm going to hit the front line because maybe the back line is all aircraft and you don't care or if it's a lot of stuff like tank traps and stuff that means your tanks can't actually hurt the front line then you'd like to try and use the air support and artillery because your combat phase is, is regimented as well so you start with anti-aircraft and any aircraft that survive that then do their ground attacks and then you choose front line or support lines mm -hmm. so you can try and cut the support lines, cut the reinforcements, cut the artillery, cut whatever else they have behind them. And then you roll in your ground support so your infantry and your armor can go in. So there, even though you've only got six cards maximum, a, fr yeah. a front row of three and three support, the options of where you put the damage that's coming and how you play it uh, is down to you. And yeah. there's an awful lot of combinations so in there. I have three mm. front cards and three back cards. Yep. The opponent attacks my front line. Yeah. I managed to kill one of the cards, so there's an empty slot there. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can then plug that again with yes, so stuff from the back. In the if, next round. In the next round, if if the battlefield's still contested, so if, if at the end of a turn you don't face any depleted or full units, yeah, then you've taken the battlefield. If your opponent's still, even if they've got a unit of tanks that are depleted, so they're they're hammered, but they're they're still holding on your opponent can reinforce them next turn and force you to fight another game, at which point you reinforce that area. So you yeah. you, you draw your hands up from your decks again and then you redeploy your, cool. your new What troops. happens when you get to the end of the decks? End of the decks is once nobody can draw any more from both decks. So if you run out before me, um, I would still be able to play on 
which means you've run out of logistics. You've you've no more supplies, no more armies to push in. I've burned up my assets. You've burned up your assets, but I can still go well. I've still another three or four cards there, which means I can reinforce this battlefield or push mm -hmm. on this battlefield. So I've, I can keep going until I've run out. And then once both sides can't draw anymore, that's the game over and you total the battlefields that you own. So um, in a small game, you only need to control three battlefields to win in a standard sort of hour and a half. That's the way I say hour and a half game. I think it's hour and a half. Is five battlefields. Yeah, it might actually be shorter than that. Regardless so for, of what I'd say, yeah. for me, what this uh, what this game does really well is a it's a, it, it's a great historical take you know, mm. uh, on a game. You know, it's um, but it's the combined arms aspect yeah. of it that I, that I really uh, really enjoyed, and it's um, it's looking at the 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 synergies um, th that your support can apply to your front lines. Um, it's yeah. really interesting because it's all in there. You know, there's artillery in there, there's tanks in there, there's various units of um, uh, infantry in there, yeah. there's aircraft in there. It's and, and when you see aircraft, the aircraft could be a Stuka, which is great anti-armor or anti-infantry mm -hmm. and terrible at anti-aircraft. Yeah. And then you could be looking at, uh, at Spitfires on the Allied side that have very little or no ground assault at all, but are absolutely devastating uh, against other aerial targets. They also give you um, blank cards. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to be up on your history and you want to try and go, well, I've got my British armor that does whatever, and I want to add something. So I don't know if there are Churchills in there or mm -hmm. something like that. So maybe you want to go, well, what if we do a, ch a unit that's a Churchill? So they've got armor. Um, they've got a good, you know, they've got solid armor, solid attack against uh, infantry and other tanks, but maybe give them a special rule about crossing yes. tank ditches because Churchills could practically climb up a mountain because the tracks were so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did, actually, at Monte Cassino. But you and your friends then, they've, they've included blank cards where if you know a bit about the history of what you're playing and you want to try some new rules out yourself between you and your yeah. friend. Or even a local unit or yeah. a unit that, an, uh, that one of your your historic family or ancestors yeah. or whatever was maybe part of. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I've got to say, um, I, I think it has legs. Uh, you know, I could, uh, I could see lots of potential expansions yeah. um, uh, for well, this. Well, this you know, is it's... very specifically the Western Front for yeah. fog and friction. Uh, so I have no doubt, like you're seeing with other companies doing sort of D-Day and then they'll move from D-Day into the low countries and then into crossing the Rhine and, and mm -hmm. you know, you've got that progression. Um, likewise, they could do North Africa, Italy, or they can do the Eastern Front and Barbarossa and then back the way. So yeah. they can quite happily have these. They could have a Pacific War one. Mm -hmm. And the way it works is there are specific cards. So you can pick a, they've said you can pick expansions uh, and battlefields, but you can't take, if you've taken an expansion, let's say we're playing the Western Front and let's say they've done a Osterbrook expansion or something in the Low Countries, and there's specific battlefields in there you want. Yes, you can take those battlefields, but only because you're taking the cards from that deck as well. You can't go and go, I'm going to take these battlefields mm -hmm. or these cards from an expansion that I'm not actually going to build my army from. Yeah. So you need to have the the synergies in there. You need to have the, the, the core set. So similar to Magic in that where you've got a core and then expansions and you can take cards from expansions um, as you wish within certain restrictions. So you can't just go completely off book and start grabbing individual cards that are very good, but not in the theater that you want to be playing in. Yeah, so. it's. It, I've got to say, cool game, and I think it. I think it could have legs. You know, if if enough, you know, kind of. I I don't think you need to be a gamer uh, no. to enjoy this. I think I think if you have like a someone in your in your family or in your circle that is a, that's a bit of a you know enjoys the historical yeah. World War Two. The, the core rules of this, um, uh, okay, uh, you're not going to get the core rules of this um, after one round. No. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you one or two games. But I think once, you know, after one or two games, the core of this is is very, very straightforward. Yeah. There's just, as with any good uh, card game, there's a lot going on. There's a lot that you need to keep an eye on. Hmm. Uh, but the core rules of this let you get that pretty quickly, but... There's a ton of additional depth in. 
Mm. There's other, uh, you know, there's all the little special rules at the bottom of the, of the cards. Like I didn't even get the chance to read them in my first round or two. Yeah. It was only as I started to get into it, I, I started to have the confidence to start to read those to see yeah. whether I'd pick one particular unit over another. And, this, and then there's also little icons and yeah. things that can unlock additional rules. Well, so. the icons we were looking at, and I know... Um, we were looking at them going, what's the icon mean? And then yeah. I double checked afterwards. And these icons simply tell you what this rule is. So if you don't know what that icon is, it's the rule for recon. Right. But once you get into the game and you know that this icon means artillery, this icon means recon, this mm -hmm. icon means um, there's like a German has Kampf group where they can mob up depleted units to make full units again and stuff like that. Yeah. Those are just little aid memoirs for cool. what's at the bottom. Yeah. Once you get into it and you start to know it, you don't even have to read the text at the bottom. You just go, oh, it's recon. It does this. Mm -hmm. This is the rule for this. And and therefore you can ignore the bottom half of the, and you're just focusing on the actual top half of the card with the, the yeah, mechanics nice and the rules. And, and you're, Simple layer yeah. of stats uh, to work through. So yeah, it's um, uh, fog and friction. Um, Sweet. It's a bit of a travel right. game too, if you slide it over. Yeah. Because the yeah. entire thing is in that one box. Well, th this is two decks essentially yeah. so that's that's the core set although i've now chucked things everywhere so there is the axis deck and the allied yeah. deck which mm -hmm. they suggest you start with these two side decks and then the middle deck is the additional 40 or 50 cards that are split between axis and allies with additional battlefields if, if you're yeah. going on a three hour then, three hour flight four four yeah. hour flight something oh, yeah. like that chuck that in your hand luggage and off you go yeah yeah, I'm just wondering, um, it, it, the, the game itself doesn't actually take up an awful lot of space. No, two, um, two you, fold down trays will probably do it in yeah, an airport. I, no, I'm just trying to, no. yeah, I'm just thinking along those lines because, you know, sometimes like for example, a game of Magic the Gathering can start to spread out all over the yeah, place. Yeah. This yeah. is actually quite condensed in that sense because you would have... Um, you've literally, you've, you've got four rows, so yeah. a support and a front line and a support and a front line for mm. both players. And then, and the, then, the battlefield and then if the, the battlefield that you're playing against, and it doesn't even have to go in the If middle. you're looking for a travel game, you want a two-player game because like we've, yeah. we've, yes. chucked, we've chucked things in our bags thinking, oh, we'll play this game because there's very few components to it. But then you realize, all oh, right, it's only really fun when there's six or seven of us. Yes. Yes. And it completely busts the whole travel thing of it. Because, because what someone's, will happen is somebody's always tired when they're traveling. Yeah, they're always yeah. Someone's always tired or someone wants to eat now, or someone's gone to the toilet, and you never get a game of it, yeah. and you're carrying around these set of cards for the, like, um, what's the one with, like, Werewolf? Ultimate Werewolf yeah, and things like that. Yeah, Werewolf and You would Citadel think, oh, easy travel and, game, yeah. but only if you've got a bunch of people. Yeah. No, it's it, it, it's it's very good. I, I'm I'm really interested to see um, I want to see where they go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how, exactly what they put into it, what, what these additional decks will give us. Um, and I'd be quite yeah. interested, actually, to... Uh, to see if there's any local units that were that were for I know we had uh, uh, units from the island of Ireland that fought. Oh yeah, um, and we're at um, the Western Front, so it, it might be it might be nice to actually even see if we can research yeah. a local unit and give them a yeah give them a, a, stat, a stat, stat somebody stat up. Them up in a card. Yeah. So yeah, well, I mean, I'll give them a little shamrock. Most of them, are, most <laughs> of them are relatively generic in there that you've seen. Yeah. So you know they are Panzergrens or Commandos. There, there's no named units. So, mm -hmm. so starting up a named unit yeah. and then making them. I can see that being nice. appealing to people because, yeah. like, when that goes to a different region, maybe there's like the opportunity to Monte Cassino or something. Yeah, I know Anna's great grandfather died at Monte Cassino. Oh right, so I could look that up. Was he a false maker? No, no, he was not. No, was, yeah. John said the same thing to me. Was he on the, was <laughs> which side was he on? Was he on the German side? I was like, no. no and then no. I was watching Remember it's Sunday and they talked about the Polish people Perfect. who had died at Monte Cassino. I said, there, see, I knew there was Polish people that fought at Monte Cassino. Yeah, po the Polish, um, I don't think it was a full division, but the Polish regiment that were there were hard, hard fighters. They had yeah. the they had the ammo carrying bear. Um <laughs> and how many or something? Yeah. It, it was literally, Trek or uh, something. Yeah, yeah. It, they had a bear that they rescued from a circus at some point, and then they um, it would carry ammo on its back up the hill because Monte Cassino <laughs> was a mountain. Wow. Uh, yeah. And after the war, um, it ended up in Edinburgh Zoo, and old Polish war veterans would go along every now and again and would. F you know, feed it cigarettes because yeah. it used to smoke with them. <laughs> so they would just like, have a smoke, have a chat, and it would come over inside the cage, they'd nick it and then put it through the bars and, and the bear would just chew down on it. Uh, so yeah, I love a, a, love a peculiar, peculiar state of affairs. So yeah. yeah, if you have a relative who took part, the, the blank cards is cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like that. I, I like the idea where if you don't 
know a huge amount. You don't care about it. You can play with it as is. Yeah. Yes. The fact that they've gone, we've added additional cards in there because you may you may decide that you want to play a specific scenario or a specific thing. My deck is themed round. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, doesn't exist in this, but here's a couple of cards and you can work out, you know, you can start up Panzer Lair or An easy thing to do, to but it's a nice touch, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's very simple and, and great, great uh, addition, I feel. There you go. Fog and Friction. Mm. Myself and Jerry will continue to play at that. We'll see if we can get you a, bring you a Let's Play yeah. or do, do a wee stream or something with that. Mm. Right. I think it's time to find out about some news. Mm. Ben, mm. tell me the news. Uh, cool, yeah. So uh, leading off on the sort of news front, we got some more previews from the guys at Atomic Mass Games. And this is effectively a preview of what's coming in, I guess you'd say, Phase 4 of uh, Marvel Crisis Protocol. And this is a look at some new models that are coming probably start next year, where we've got the Guardians of the Galaxy making an appearance in the game. So uh -huh. we've got Rocket and Groot. Oh. Yes. leading the way which is very cool i really really like this model i think it's an absolutely fantastic one i love the way that they've got the sort of dynamism between the two mm, where you know like yes. uh, groot's route is coming through the other way and rocket is riding it very very awesome indeed you've also got uh star lord flying in with his uh rocket boots and stuff and his mm -hmm. blasters which is very awesome and then following on from him as well we've also got nebula and gamora who are also looking very cool and nice and dynamic as well uh, so we've got a whole bunch of the guardians of the galaxy here no Drax yet, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah. No, no, no Dave Batista. But so what's Gamora <laughs> wearing? Uh, some sort of armored suit, I imagine. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, because these are more the cartoon. Oh, yeah, it's, it's more the, the comic book. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, used to seeing her leather, leather yeah. socks. <laughs> it, but it's, it's, it is unusual because they're, um, there's an awful lot to build on. So, I mean, Star-Lord, that Star-Lord comes more from... The Star Lord we know from the film, from the movies, yeah, because yeah, yeah. the Star Lord in the comics doesn't look like that, uh -huh, or at least no. didn't before the comic or before the films ah. came out. And then, uh, you know, he's retro because at that stage, the Guardians of the Galaxy, he was more sort of um, uniformed Nova Corps. He, he looked like a soldier type of thing, and the Guardians weren't this terribly desperate group mm -hmm. of of flying scumbags but it's interesting that he's in a little kit by himself because you would have thought if yeah. they've doubled up on nearly everybody if it's not like a giant model like yes. the hulk or mordok then they've, they've normally paired you know, and you're going at that point this is Star Lord, man. Do you know what I they prepare. should have put in that box a mixtape a mixtape mix <laughs> maybe there is maybe that's why we don't have the room for anything else because it's mixtaped up what, yeah. one of the things people have been saying is obviously we were missing here. Maybe he's going to come along with um, his daughter. So you've got Moon Dragon that could potentially be brought in. Yeah. That's from something that's a little bit further off. And obviously, they've not really looked at that kind of comic booky style too much so far mm -hmm. in these releases. A lot of it has been focused around the idea of the kind of characters from the movies and stuff. So yeah, maybe we'll recognize. see that in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, but um, this also leads on to some foes that a lot of people will know from the movies. If anyone watched Infinity War and Endgame as well, we've got two members of the I've, Black Order. I've heard about those. Yeah. yeah, so we've got uh, Corvus <gasps> Glaive and Proxima Midnight, who I think look absolutely amazing. Oh, yes. Especially Corvus Glaive. I think mm -hmm. he looks really epic, sort of lunging forward with that Volge in his hand. It's very cool. What about Star-Lord's daddy? Have we got him yet? No, we don't have Ego yet. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> you want to do, 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 do your Ego yeah. there. <laughs> I don't do an Ego. I don't yeah, know you what do. you mean. Just take your glasses off and immediately. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There you go. It's him. That, Ego. It's, it's him. <laughs> it's, it's just that much grey in the hair these days. Is that what it is? Yeah. All you have to do is go, it's, it's all in the reflexes. Yeah. <laughs> it's all in the reflexes. No, but there's this uh, pretty cool looking set of releases. As I say, this is more or less like phase four now of the releases for this. Like yeah. Wave four anyway. So this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be seeing next year. This also marks the end of all the previews that we've seen uh, from Gen Con mm. this year. And yeah. it was all shown off in the cases. So anything we see past this is going to be brand new and spanking and awesome uh not not just spanking in general but yeah uh we obviously saw thanos at uh eschenspiel this year yeah, so yes. that's going to be a new model coming our way and hopefully we're going to see a lot more stuff in the coming months i know that atomic mass have put a lot of effort into this one so i'm sure there's going to be lots and lots of things coming our way i really i'm crossing my fingers for x-men i really want to see x-men so yeah <laughs> I'm, i imagine we will I, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. It's 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 a hell of a game that they've put together. It really yeah. is. It really is fun. Yeah. Right. Um, so after 
uh, all of the excitement of the Sisters of Battle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, congratulations to anybody that managed to get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but next up, um, we are looking at Mephiston. Mm. What's the, what's yes. the crack of Mephiston? Did yeah, they, so did they got, Primaris him, did they? Yeah, so he's gone. He's crossed the Rubicon Primaris. Mm -hmm. Now the new Primaris version of Conquered Death again, effectively. Conquered the Black Rage, and he's ready to get stuck in and kill loads of people with his psychic abilities and things because he's going to be the sort of headline figure of the next book in the Psychic Awakening uh, sort of installments and expansions for one forty thousand called Blood of Baal, which obviously will have a lot of a focus around the Blood Angels one we'll see. Yeah. But yeah, so we got a really cool look at the model here, which is actually based on some previous artwork of him that was done in black and white form back in the day. Mm. And as you can see, you've got the version of the model here with his plasma gun sort of out, or plasma pistol, sorry, out, firing in front of him. But there's also going to be an op optional hand which has him sort of wiping blood away from his mouth. Oh, I think I prefer that one. I think I prefer that one. Anything yeah. is so, anything is a bit different. Hmm. You know, it's um, he's yeah. he's he's quite Dracula, isn't he? It's, as you would expect, is. I it's, suppose. It's good timing. Space vampires. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is good timing because uh, War Games Illustrated have just released a Peter Cushing Van Helsing model. Have they really? <laughs> they have. Yeah. 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 <laughs> With the two candlesticks crossed from the end of that Dracula one. So. Yeah. Yeah, we'll bring him. We'll bring him in as a as an inquisitor yeah, into yeah. forty k. <laughs> that, that's how you deal with the blood angels, right there. That would be fantastic. Yep. One thing that people are actually really quite uh, they they really liked about this is that they managed to keep a lot of the sort of silhouette of what Mephiston was like, yeah. uh, and then carried it over to the Primaris sort of version of him. And they've also kept his little chest nipples. They've yep. got his nipples going on his armor, yeah. so of course you've got to have that there. But very very cool. I, I was I said in the news story for this one as well. Somewhere there's a von Karstein who's very angry at the wardrobe department in their own castle. Yes, they didn't manage to supply them with such luxurious cloaks and armor. But uh, yeah, very cool. It is. <laughs> it's it's very nice. And uh, weirdly, it was one of the things about the original Mephiston that got me to buy one because mm -hmm. I don't collect blood the angels. Nipples. The nipples. Uh, that armor. <laughs> that yes. that ribbed armor because this came out hot in the heels of. Coppola's version of Dracula. That's right, yes. Which had that style of armor mm -hmm. in the little pre credit sequence where he, mm -hmm. he defies God and suicides himself um, with Gary Oldman. Yeah. And, and it was wearing that ridged red armor and it looked fantastic. And I seen the model and went, oh, that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and any day now, I'm going to finish that paint job. No, I'm not going to finish that paint job. But yeah. <laughs> it, it, but it's there's a, contrast paints now, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> It's still not going to somebody uses it. a run night. So, yeah, yeah, somebody tell me what are the little blood vials uh, the, that are hanging around his waist? That that is because he is a vampire. The blood angels are all vampires. Yeah, yeah. Do, do they do they do that kind of stuff then? Is he? he like, oh yeah, they, they look like bobos. He, he just he takes a rest and cracks one open and yeah. sucks it off. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Nice. Sometimes you need to. There we go. Sometimes the red thirst comes up on you in the middle of a fight. And all you're fighting is something like Necrons, and there's nobody to bite. At which point you need a vial of blood. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Have I told you recently that you love me? That I love War Games Atlantic. All right, not not enough. No, we War Games Atlantic have been doing some sterling stuff. Like really, they have yeah. really really nice stuff. Mm. And now we have mm. their preview of the pointy eared. Yeah, so <laughs> this okay, is one that. Wave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to say this is one that Jerry picked out earlier in the week, but this was a preview that came out of some of their new plastic. Can, going to be coming out for the elves, as Jerry uh, talked about in the article. Actually, here they have a little bit of a wood elfy sort of feel to them. There's lots of leaf motifs and that mm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They've got the moccasins on as well, so these would be pretty good for you to use in kind of like your wood elf armies. If you're going to be building those up, but of course, if you're doing any kind of elf army, that kind of leaf motif sort of works across pretty much everything. There, it, so it all really depends on the kind of paint scheme that you want to go through with the army. But this just seems like another really nice sort of, and I, I use the word in the best way possible, generic elf set that you can oh here 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 i've got a new i've got a new phrase for you i've got a news phrase for a okay. new phrase for yeah. you um um i had been for the longest time working on what i was calling generic uh, fantasy armies okay mm -hmm. i no longer call them that because I, th I felt it was insulting and it didn't it didn't do them the justice i now call them agnostic fantasy that's a good armies. good word yeah, so good. these are agnostic fantasy agnostic elves, elves. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay so it's um I really like them. I like their wee leaves. Really cool. I I like 
If only they had a wee leaf on their cape, it'd be amazing. Yeah, well, they have one on their quiver. Um, I like the fact that even things like the um, spear or the, the arrow point. The arrow. The arrow yes. point itself is a little leaf, little like an ivy yeah. leaf. You could uh -huh. even use that wee pointer to point on if you wanted. I could use that wee pointer. You're right there. Yeah. So <laughs> this bit here. Yeah. That I know that it was really annoying. Yes. Right, but you know, hey ho. Um, <laughs> but, but even look at the wee detail on the arrowhead. Yeah. It's, it, you could you could easily have just had that as just a plain yeah. arrowhead. But uh, no, there's a, a nice little detail and, on that. Things so. like the uh, the end of the belt buckle being yeah. another leaf here. But even look at the way that belt buckle is folded in on it. So yeah. yeah, isn't that nice? Yeah, that's a nice touch. And these so. are, as they've said, these are still work in progress. So yeah, um, they're not. These aren't the finalized sculpt. There's still tweaks and tidying mm -hmm. up to be done. But they're planning on doing the set as yeah. spears. Arrows and uh, hand weapons, yeah, and shields. Swords, so, swords and so shields. yeah, so the body itself is going to be one piece, and then the heads, arms, and additional parts will be separate. Mm -hmm. um, cool, yeah. Which is very nice because when you see one of the other ones, if I can, it's going to wash make, well make with those machine. details. So you see all the ruffles and stuff. Yes. If you're just into painting with washes or contrast paints and stuff, splish mm. splash, and you're done. Yeah. So I mean that one there. So the dagger the sword and the quiver on that are all going to be separate yeah so if you want to you can have a very just generic mm -hmm. archer unit or you can add the additional bits on if you want to start to make it more heavy make, yeah mm -hmm. um so yeah there, there's a lot to be said for it i quite like it I, if, I quite like their journey through the classic races because yeah. they've yeah they went undead skellies great they, they had a very ray harryhausen greek feel yes then they've done a a uh, set of halflings that are very um, halflingy. <laughs> they're, they're, they're very medieval French English, sort of Hundred Years' War, thirteen hundred, yes. and, and the very nice pike bow. What you would expect when you think halfling, yes. Uh, but these, they've they've given them that that unusual. There's little unusual tweaks and flavors, like the they're not getting a, a long bow that you would expect to see. Just a very dull. They've got these yes. lovely recurved bows with little horn tips on them, and mm -hmm. uh, it's just nice little features. So. I'm wondering where they're going to go next. I assume we'll probably see dwarves, but because people are fickle, they ask on their, their face page, uh, sort of on Fridays, they do little Friday polls going, what do people want to see next? And, yeah. <laughs> and, and they leave it, they normally leave it open where people can add things in. So things like kobolds, yeah, uh, little dog face That'd goblins. Cool. I want yeah. werewolves. Got pushed right up there. Yeah. So it, it's interesting because they're not they're not but, precisely going. We we have an idea of where we're going and yeah. things we're working on. But but is it just one set in each of these things? Do they yeah. build enough to build armies, or is it just like literally it, one? It, there's one, your box. Off it's you one go. set now. The one sets are generally sort of yeah. forty odd miniatures or that sort of thing. Where because when I was looking at this, got multiple types of weaponry in them. I was thinking they'd be a great compliment if you're building a fantasy army and you do the elves and your yeah. mate did say the Northmen from Fireforge. Yeah. They'd probably sit really well beside yeah. each other. Oh yeah. So it'd be really yeah. cool if there's enough in there to make, you know, um, get two or three boxes and just make a load of archers yeah. and make a, a load of spear spears and a load of, and a load of sword, sword and shields. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's the way they're they're sort of aiming the boxes. They're not going for here's an elf army. Here's some cavalry. Here's some mm. infantry. Here's some heavy armored. They're not doing a lot of different boxes of the same thing at the moment. They're mm. kind of reaching out and filling gaps that other yeah. ranges aren't. Yeah. So, one, sorry, I was going to say one of the to, to sort of build on that. One of the things that it seems to be a good fit for seeing these plastic sets working off quite nicely against the stuff that we see a lot from uh, North Star. So obviously the things that they yeah. do in plastic sets for Frostgrave. And we've got Oathmark coming out next year as well yeah. from Osprey. Yes. And so they, they're building. So these elves in particular, if you look at the style of them and the way they've been done and that kind of heroic nature to them, they're just about the right sort of proportions and styles to max, match sorry, match with the kind of plastic sets that we're getting from them yeah. for their elves. Well, and, when you think about it, there has never been... Um, in my humble opinion, there has never been a better time um, for fantasy um, yeah. wargaming. Yeah. Because uh, you look at what we've got right now. We've got Kings of War 3. Yeah. So there's your rank and flank um, yeah. uh, covered there. We have um, Saga Age of Magic, um, Oathmark. Warlords. Uh, Warlords Edwan. Um, uh, Dragon it, Rampant. With Dragon Rampant. There, there's a ton of yeah. options there for a fantasy yeah. game and this is and why i love the idea 
of agnostic fantasy yeah, armies. Yeah. I, it's just a, the whole possibility of being able to create fantasy armies to my own specification and not having to tie it too much. I think no, it's not having to shoehorn it into something. Yeah, yeah. You're, I find I, I f if we were back in the day where really everybody was only ever playing Warhammer Fantasy yeah. Battles, okay. That's okay, that's fine, it's interesting and stuff, but it's been such a release for me to be able to say, forget about the meta, hmm. build a beautiful army, yeah. just build an army that you enjoy putting together, and then um, uh, the games now are starting to have enough flexibility in there that I can just I can yeah. bring my stuff to the game. And I, and I really like that separation of church and state. Yeah. Yeah. And the companies saying, so. and the companies that you mentioned, the likes of North Star, um, Fireforge Games, Atlantic War Games, yeah. these ranges that they've all been coming out with all seem to be complementing each other really yeah. well. Because yeah. I love like the 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 dwarves from Oathmark, Oathmark. Yeah. because they look a bit more gnomish mm. rather than just like a regular dwarf. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I'm going to do this slightly different type of dwarf here now. It's all really cool the way yeah. it's blending together, and this idea that you can then take the, like you're not I'm, I'm not playing Warhammer Fantasy, I'm playing another game, and I'll yeah, and yeah. I'll bring my flavor of army to this. This is it, that, rather know. than I'm just bringing the usual dwarves that you have. Hmm. This is my flavor of dwarves or my flavor of elves. There's something to be said for in in in, in uh, embracing a, a part of the hobby, so hmm. the, the the old world in Warhammer Fantasy or even Age of Sigmar for that matter. You can you can lose yourself in that, and you can read the novels and and really yeah. get, go to town on it, right? But you always run the risk, and I've, I've talked for years about gaming in the gaps. You always run the risk that the, the game designers decide to do something almost apocalyptic, like they did with the old world, and now they're re readdressing that yeah. balance with look at the possibility of bringing it back. But I've got to say, as someone now who um, I've reached a certain level of um, experience within my hobby, mm. the, 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 I can't overstate how um, much of a sense of freedom yeah. I get from that separation of the church and state, that separation of rules from, from models. From miniatures, yeah. Um, I, I, I am, I'm enjoying it far more than I ever realized mm -hmm. that I would. And now that I'm in it, I would be very reluctant to go back out of it, if you know what I mean, to, to, to have to just tie myself yeah. to to the one range and to the one meta mm. uh, it's been very liberating i've got to say i've been, I've been uh, basically it's like burning a war zone sized bra yeah it's, it's been <laughs> brilliant big, big, <laughs> it's a big bra man. somebody call red adair <laughs> that's a fire needs put out that's a big release I have to say, one of my favorite things about what war games atlantic have been doing is the fact that they seem to be coming alongside so they're a relatively new company especially as far as plastics go but we've already seen um, Warlord release Imperial Romans, Vetrix have released Romans, then Conquest Miniatures have done Normans, yes. um, Gripping Beast have done Normans, Vetrix have done Normans. They've, all these people seem to be retreading, like, we need to have our Vikings, we need to have our Normans, we need to have our Romans, we need to have our Greeks. And you look at them and it's multiple, multiple people doing the same thing, and they've come in and gone, we're going to do Dark Age Irish. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to do uh, Persians. Mm -hmm. to fight against the Greeks and the the armies that supplement or that would go alongside that nobody else is doing they've been going well rather than retread the same ground that other companies have been doing we're going to supplement or or abut them and therefore if people want to get Greeks and they've already got Vetrix Greeks what's the point in us releasing our own Greeks let's release Persians you mentioned you mentioned Conquest yeah. from Parabellum mm -hmm. Um, uh, you've got it now. It, it, we just saw this just moments before uh, we we came into filming here. Um, but in the forums, um, uh, on the GW th uh, thread, I don't know if you can find it. It's about the the somebody has posted a teaser mm -hmm. that Conquest have put up of where they're headed next over the next uh, two or three years. Right, and they have uh, they have some concept art in that <laughs> teaser image. Well, don't everybody look at once. Yeah. yeah so if somebody can have a, if somebody can have a look for it, Ben, if you can find it and then text it to the to the Jerry, and uh, Jerry can bring it up. But they have, um, they have uh, uh, some concept art of where they're headed, and um, they they have a human faction in there. Jerry, I think you're going to love mm -hmm. it. But 
they have a noble orc um you know, well, that'd in be there, interesting. which is just oh man it is is so good so there I'll, I'll point with fingers there's there seems to be a me rocking uh-huh. the central parting look at the concept of the top do you see your your greek oh yeah like kind yeah. of a thing mm-hmm. that is funky isn't I it i thought you might like that and then the noble orc you know that that kind of noble savage um orc I, i'm more worried about this that undead looking thing yeah but it's got wings it's like some yeah. sort of creepy angel I, I believe they think they've listed the names there so you've got the city states who are those sort of steampunky greeks yep. uh-huh. you've got the undead the Wadron, who are those yep. sort of orcish creatures, and then the Weavers, who sound very interesting. Mm. Like the sound of those. So. Uh, loving this. That that one image now confirms that the, that range is is mm. is now eight uh, eight factions. Yeah, because we are now at the stage where we we are literally in the last few days are now at the stage where I believe we have the four factions or. For, um, I know we have the 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 dwarves, the or dwarves, the, or the dwagon, no, dwag home. Yeah, uh, ran a bit late. They hope to have those out in October, and um, they because of manufacturing issues, they ran about four four weeks behind, four to five weeks. Mm-hmm. So they've landed now, but rather than push back the Nord, yeah. which are their Viking esque faction of humans, um, who were slated for November December, rather than push them back, they just went, no, we're going to keep that. Yeah. So, so they're not going to run behind their mm-hmm. the schedule because of the manufacturing clip. So, just just to clarify, I don't think they're I don't think they're humans. The Nord. I, I don't know. Because when you look at the their helmets. faces, they've got um, strange sort of not quite human look to them. Yeah, I, I've been very careful not to lift any of their helmets <laughs> off, uh, <laughs> any of them. So, yeah, but they have a, a very Viking esque look. Let's see if I can find them. But, the, yeah. but you know, as I'm saying, you know, it, the, I don't, I can't remember a better time to be into fantasy gaming. Yeah, exactly. Than, yeah. than, than what we have at the moment, it, it's it's like a, a massive. It's like it's a fantasy. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> is this and, a real life? <laughs> is this just fantasy war gaming? And it continues because in the yeah. next story, Playing North Star are hitting us with goblin wolf riders. Yeah, so these are a bunch of plastic releases that, and also some metal bits and pieces that people have been begging to see in more detail for a really long time. They showed up a couple of previews at events and things like that, but this was the full proper look at the sprues and some of the options you're going to be getting. So this is going to be a set that I'm reliably informed, 15 in a box. Nice. So you get 15 Goblin Wolf Riders in mm. there on those big chonky walls who have definitely had too much of their uh, their doggy food. Uh, and you've also got those a uh, whole bunch of goblins that are running on the back, armed with spears, bows, and hand weapons and shields and that kind of thing as well. They're also going to be doing a set of sort of metal characters and things that you can use. So you'll be able to use them to represent things like command figures. You can see in the top um, image from that post, you've also got a uh, sort of a shaman on a wolf ride on a wolf as well, which I think mm. is very very cool. But yeah, and just another option that's coming our way for the uh, for the, the different armies that are going to be arriving as part of Oathmark, which is coming out next year. Uh, from Osprey and also obviously the plastic range from North Star. This is also the first time we're actually getting to see, well, no, I guess you'd say the second time, we're starting to see a different set coming out for one of the factions. So previously we've seen a lot of stuff on foot and it was kind of like your core infantry base. Yeah. The dwarves then got their heavy infantry, which is sort of like their big additional thing. And now we're seeing for the goblins, the wolf riders here that you can see, which are looking very, very cool indeed. And they've definitely got that kind of old school Tolkien-esque feel to them, which I really like. And uh, yeah, very cool. The the wolves themselves have kind of divided opinion here yeah. and there. Uh, some people think they look a little bit too smooth. They look not, a bit. Not enough fur, but um, yeah, they I look, think they look a bit They look sort of almost lion-esque as well, these wolves. They're a bit weird looking, yeah. I don't mind them being so smooth, because smooth is good. But yeah. when I was looking at the sideways views, they did remind me of almost like a bear muzzle on some of them mm-hmm. yeah because the the faces are the muzzle isn't that elongated it's yeah, got it's very a, a very st- stumpy, stumpy yeah, yeah. Uh, they've almost got like a wargish wargish feel to yeah them. yeah you know, sort of like remember the old the the old <laughs> the lord of the rings movies they're not that old but <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like 20 yeah. years now mate yeah well, <laughs> yeah. yeah no i like them i, yeah. I Look I'm at Ben's face. It. Dawn, it's just dawned on him how, how old he is. Old he is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then um, <laughs> continuing with the, with the mode of fantasy. This is the fantasy episode, this one. Is, yes. We now have a full list of the Kings of War Uncharted Empires armies uh, has been announced. So 
Um, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this was a little bit of a Q&A that Man did. Uh, the new Uncharted Empires book with Man weeks past where Jerry sat down with the guys, uh, Rob and stuff, to, to go through the game and that kind of thing. And this is the book that's going to allow you to play a whole bunch of different armies and themes for armies uh, that don't quite fit into the kind of uh, main selection of, of offerings for the world of Panathor and Kings of War. Uh, so in here, I, I believe there's going to be 12 new sort of mm -hmm. lists, I guess you'd say. So you've got the Brotherhood, who are then split down into the Order of the Brother Mark and the Order of the Green Lady. You've got Free Dwarves, Salamanders, Sylvan Kin, the Herd, so think Beastmen, Kingdom of Men, the League of Ro Rodia, which also includes some of the Halflings, which people were, were upset seem to have dis disappeared. You've got the Ratkin, the Ratkin Slaves, which we can see a preview for some of the mm. down below that, and also the Twilight Kin and the Varangar as well. So as I said, uh, and I'm sure Jerry can go into it in a little bit more detail, this will allow you to have a whole bunch of sort of like master lists for a bunch of the different factions in here. But then there's also going to be some themes that will then be applied to some of the existing factions to give them a little bit more of a sort of like a unique and interesting flair. Uh, but one of the key things I think is really cool about this is that we're starting to see uh, the guys at Mantic really sort of taking the idea of, hey, hit me sitting there and sort of gathering dust and that kind of thing. But what we're seeing them do with some of their sort of separate model releases, like you can see for the, the Ratkin there, and also some of the artwork, like the stuff that you see on the front of the book, is they're kind of giving it a little bit more of that Panathor Kings of War feel. So they're taking a lot of these armies and going, hey, this is what it would be like if it was in Panathor, which mm. I think is really cool. So yeah. obviously on the front cover, you've got the Bretonians, I'm going to say, against some lizard men, which kind of gives you echoes of uh, Warhammer Fantasy past and stuff. But it's nice to see them doing some stuff that is sort of like wholly mantic. About yeah. this thing. Is, this, this. is this the book that I need to get a list from my Russ, Russ from? Yes, this, yes. this is yes. it. So the, the first time we've seen Uncharted Empires... Um, they were just about to release second edition when the old world got exploded. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> they, um, there were an awful lot of people with fantasy armies that weren't interested in Sigmar. So they kind of rushed to get Uncharted Empires out that contained um, composite versions. So you had a Bretonian esque list, a mm -hmm. Skaven esque list, a Lizardman esque list, and so on and so forth. And then a couple of other lists at the end that were solely Mantic. So Trident Realms, so Fishmen, mm -hmm. and uh, Night Stalkers, so literally elf nightmares made real. Um, this time around, they've had more time, so those lists were very rushed. They, they had like two to two to three months between concept and printing mm -hmm. to get the book out. Um, they took all the lists they had, split them. The ones that Mantic make made the third edition rulebook. Yes. So it is... That's Mantic, that's their core. Mm -hmm. But not wanting to leave any of the lists that existed behind, they've gone into Uncharted Empires. And the master lists and theme lists are interesting because that came over from Kings of War Historic, mm -hmm. where you had a essentially the master list was just all the human things ever. So if you can think of a human thing that has fought between <laughs> biblical times and Napoleonics, it had a version in that master list. So spearmen, pikemen, bowmen, yeah. light archers, Mongol warriors, chariots, all of that. And then they went, okay, but if you don't want to play a everything that ever existed ever human list for historics, if you want to play a Roman list, then tweak it. So take these things out, mm -hmm. add these units in. Uh, and this Uncharted Empires builds on that. So um, mm -hmm. the Kingdoms of Men list is the master list for king all the kingdoms of men in Panathor. So generic human civilizations in Panathor, they use kingdoms of men. The League of Rodria, who are a faction that's like a city-state conglomerate of humans and halflings, they take the human kingdoms of men list and then they go tweak. So you add in halflings, you add in these, you take out other things that they don't have access to and that gives you your theme list. Mm -hmm. Likewise, uh, the two elf lists in this, so the Twiglets, sorry, the Twilight Kin, <laughs> and the Sylvan Kin, who are sort of wood elves, they both take the elf list from the main rulebook, and then they go, well, if you want to make them more woody, here's your tree men, your dryad type creatures, your stampedes of animals that have been summoned forth from the forest to run over people's heads, werewolves, hopefully, uh, all of that. So you have these 
ability to go in and theme your list to a specific style of play or a specific faction mm. yeah rather than having to write a whole list specifically for it to go and know that it's so similar all you're really doing is going twiglet kin are regular elves who also have demons and nightmares working for them with them beside them above them who knows mm -hmm. um so that yeah there, there's some interesting things going there even things like the ratkin because the ratkin were very they were very scavenly um but mantic taking them now and building them into the, the actual structure of panathor as a world and going no they're here this is what they are this is where they are from here's the backstory behind them and then the ratkin mm -hmm. slaves are subservient to the abyssal dwarves mm -hmm. so they are literally a slave race so a lot of the stuff that the ratkin either have or got gets mm. sort of taken away because they're more or less just menial servants to the abyssal dwarves and it'll be interesting to see what they do because I, this is going to be sort of a feature that they can run going forward theme lists they've already got for um dead zone and um vanguard the skirmish games mm -hmm. where they can go if you take this character this is the the style of list that you're <laughs> going to build so if you want yeah. to take a um enforcer list that's more about the scouting and sniping people you take this guy and then it changes what your mm -hmm. core troops and going forward in new supplements and new expansions they're going to kind of do this where they go you take this list and then if you want to do this you tweak it so dwarves are very big in Panathor in King's War because Ronnie Renton's a huge dwarf fan. Yeah. So it's one of the few fantasy worlds you'll come across where dwarves, uh, yeah, very impressed with that on you, Ben. Yeah. Dwarves are not dying in Panathor. When things went <laughs> wrong, dwarves shut the doors to their mountain strongholds and then they opened them up and kicked the living tar out of all the people who were trying to survive floods and stuff and went, yeah. all this land is ours. So dwarves are, dwarves are, are the- thriving. Dwarves are thriving. Dwarves are room for Panathor. Dwarves mm -hmm. are the imperial nation that is kicking the living tar out of everybody. Some dwarves went, we shouldn't be doing this. So there's a theme list in this book where they're a bit more above ground. They're not involved with the imperial dwarves. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're a bit more flexible. They've got more rangers. They've got more badger riding, berserking nutbags because that's what we want to see in free dwarf lists. They're very much the Scottish, you can take our lives, you'll never take our freedom dwarves. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and being able to go in there and go, and this is the sort of style of it is, is very interesting. So they've left themselves a, an awful lot of room that they can run free in. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Right. Final bit of news. Okay. <laughs> um, Undaunted North Africa has been announced. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a game that's coming out next year, quite a way off in June 2020. Highlighted because we've done a little bit of stuff here in, about World War Two. I'm going to be talking about, about that a little bit later as well. But this is a really awesome game that they're going to be expanding on. Um, so Undaunt Undaunted North Africa is going to be a new game that follows on from Normandy, which was their release that has done exceptionally well across the board. When it comes to board gamers and war gamers. And this takes us to North Africa, where you're going to be playing as the Long Range Desert Group or the Italian Army. And the game is a little bit of a mix between... Uh, sort of like think memoir 44 and that kind of moving troops around on the on a battlefield mm -hmm. this time obviously their tokens and stuff but there's also a deck building mechanic built into it as well which i think is very very cool indeed uh to sort of give you a rundown of exactly what daunted is what will happen is you'll have a, a set of scenarios in the back of the book and you'll lay out the tiles some of which you can see in that new story there done in sort of like deserty style and then that will set up the kind of map that you'll play out your your game on You'll actually then take tokens which represent some of the different units that you have. Uh, so, for example, in Normandy, it's the US Army versus the Germans, and you'll set them up on the table. And then what you'll do, a little bit like games like Memoir 44, you'll play cards to activate a particular type of unit on the battlefield. So it might be your riflemen, your scouts, your machine gunners, maybe your commanders and that kind of thing. And they'll move around trying to take control of areas, you know, dominating things, taking objectives, and obviously shooting the enemy and that kind of thing as well. But then the deck building element comes into it. And instead of it being sort of your sort of drafting for more troops, it's you drafting for your men fighting on and being braver and doing more acts of valor and that kind of thing. So you'll use certain specific characters like your commanders to draw more decks, uh, more cards into your hand to then give your characters more activations on the tabletop. And one of the really cool things that they've done for it is they've kind of really added a little bit more 
personalization to the game. So each of the characters has their own name and you kind of get to know them a little bit more, which is really cool. You could play through the game as a, as a campaign as well as it just being um, standalone stuff as well. So they've really, really gone to town with this one. And as far as I've seen, for a lot of people who've looked at this and reviewed it, they've really, really enjoyed it. So while we looked at the start of the show at... Um, fog and friction which kind of takes that sort of like broader look at a battle line between two opposing factions fighting you know across the entire france for example this game i think is really cool because it takes things down to a lot more of a squad level and you're almost fighting it fighting it on sort of like a, a sort of like a, a mini sort of battle a band of brothers style level which i think is really cool um so if you haven't checked it out i definitely go and check this one i think you guys would absolutely love this game uh, mm -hmm. if you want it if you picked it up it would be really really fun to see you guys give this one a go Happy days. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well up for that. Right. Jerry, you yes. got a chance to uh, sit down with Chris. I did. Um, from Battlefront. We got a chance to play a game, and then after he cheated his way to victory, we sat down <laughs> and, and talked about where we currently are with the um, D-Day Global Campaign. So we're about halfway through. So we're just we were on the cusp of the third week when I sat down with him. Hello folks, I'm joined once again by Chris from Battlefront and we're going to be talking about um, the global campaign. Yep. We're about to move into week three, so we're pretty much the start of halfway through, if that makes sense. Start uh, of halfway through. Start yeah, of halfway yeah. through yeah, for, yeah, for, for, for the six-week campaign. Um, so we're just sort of a catch-up to see how things are currently going. Yeah. Um, so you've actually been doing quite well because you're playing the Filthy Allies. I am. Uh, my, me personally, I'm doing okay. Yeah. I wouldn't say really well. There's been more luck than judgment, I think, mm -hmm. on some of the battles. Um, but yeah, the Allies are winning so far. So week one, they've taken and held every sector. Mm -hmm. Week two, the results are just being compiled and just finalized uh, before we switch over to week three. So it's all to play for if anybody gets in before that refresh button gets hit. Yep. Um, so every week, the battles are, are really important, actually. We've found that they're quite close. Yeah, yeah. This is the thing that surprised me, uh, is just how close some of the actual sectors have been. Um, and I don't know what it's like on the allied side in your forums if people are <laughs> if if anybody has sort of stepped forward for a command and control point of view going you really need to push results into this sector over this sector yeah i mean an enemy ear is always listening so i can't yeah. say too much uh you know just in case got to keep mom haven't i really um mm. but there is one or two uh personalities is what i like to say yeah. and they are yeah they're, they're pushing for it last week it was uh we got to help the british in on on bridges mm. so there was quite a few allied games played there uh my americans definitely uh slipped across the border and, and gave them a quick hand um and then this week yeah it's a lot of guys we need some help here uh you know guys and girls get in here let's play some games here let's do this let's try and push and it's all about picking your sector benefits as well. Yeah. Um, you know, let's not focus necessarily on this sector because it's not going to help us next week that much. So we'll, we'll push for the other one. And yeah, it's going quite well. The forums are really lively, actually. Yeah. It's good to see. So um, I've made you sit down and go through some of the... Uh, <laughs> oh, the, it, was, it was so awful. I oh, to yeah, sit there was, and read battle it, reports. It was, it was brilliant. It was terrible. <laughs> Just the worst. Uh, so uh, I think if we have a look and actually yeah, see absolutely. how the various sectors have got on. Mm, yeah, no uh, problem. Uh, so first off, we have well, we've got you. So this is me, yeah. If anybody so he wants to try and novel vaping, you know, just go for that. <laughs> or you know, get them commendations in there. You know, I mean, uh, it's all about the like button, isn't it? Yeah, you're you're a major, which is uh, not yeah, bad. I'm doing all right. I got promoted twice last night, actually. So I was captain um, promoted last night from our battle report that I posted of our let's play that we kind of did. I say let's play. It was yeah. more just as throwing some dice, having fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I got promoted again this morning for people commending the battle report. So. Uh, it's quite good this screen. This this really shows where essentially you're at as a commander. So it's shown where I'm scoring points and it's very individual. Yeah. Um and it's good at the bottom as when you you sort of as you scroll down because you can go towards the achievements. Uh you've got obviously your battle reports on there. And the achievements are for doing specific things. Yeah. Uh whether that's interacting in the forums, whether that's interacting with uh, actual battle reports. Mm -hmm. And getting content in there as well so it's not just text or just pictures yeah. as i did on my first couple it's actually learning to put videos in there and uh breaking the text down i mean we'll see later on we go across some of the battle reports some really good examples of yeah of just, text pictures and everything yeah. yeah yeah just showing how the um the actual system allows you to tweak and play with it and yeah. you can even once you when you've started putting things in there you can move them around so if you type out a block of text and then go oh hang on it would be better if I put the map in here first. You can put the map in and then just swap them. Yes. So, so yeah. you're, not, you're not locked in there and you don't have to worry about, 
oh, I've just put in the wrong thing. I have to delete everything I've just done and start <laughs> again because there's nothing more frustrating than having to start again from scratch. Absolutely. So yeah, it is nice to see. Yeah. Um, and it's that, like I say, it's that complete interaction and, and getting everybody interested and then it's commenting on other people's battle reports. You know, what you like about it, what you don't like about it, mm. chance for improvement. And we're just talking about the uh, the interaction from some of the lead vocal people out there and they are very good. This is what looks really good in a battle report. And mm. it's, you know, it's some of the forums. It's actually, okay, we'll, we'll do that then. That's a good theme for it. My battle reports, I try to do all black and white pictures. Yeah. I kind of go down the whole period feel of the photos and it adds a certain aesthetic to it. Yeah. If nothing else, and makes it stand out. So hopefully people will know my name before me doing a, a shameless shout out. Or <laughs> yeah. Well, um, <laughs> you that's, know. that's the way to do it. I even noticed um, some people like uh, Guderian, I think, pointed mm. out in somebody's battle report where he's got a great battle report. By the way, if you've linked this, with your friend, then you always get six VPs right off the bat, you know, yeah. for, from linking them. So just even things like that, where they've both done two battle reports and just haven't done that last little step. So. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I'll, we'll show later on because we'll go on to the battle report I, I wrote. Mm -hmm. So I'm just waiting for you to put your version on and then all we'll do is just put the link in and, yeah. and off we go. Um, so what we're looking at here, this is the uh, the Battlefront yeah. UK. So we're back in our offices in Nottingham. We've actually got a, a store club. So mm -hmm. we've got a few guys from the community that come down on a Thursday night what we did is we went right let's have our own club to for the global campaign and we did and we put it yeah. on here we've got uh, about 10 people at the moment that are actively playing games some staffs mostly outside people as yeah. we call them those outsiders. outsiders not not from this village new no. uh but no they, they come down every thursday and we play for about five hours or so get quite a few games in uh and as you can see you know there's a couple of days when we've played a lot of battles yeah. or we've been reported so the first november was my birthday. I remember it was a Friday. So everybody who played on the Thursday night recorded on the Friday yeah. day. Uh, and as you can see, we, we played a lot of red sector for that one. But then every other day or so, we've been having a couple of battles going on, yeah. one or two. Um, and it's just about, again, that community feel for it. And it's a bit of, uh, oh, you did really well in that battle. Yeah, I'm going to try and do better than you in that battle. And then mm. it gets that sort of... Yeah, the friendly rivalry, I think, is the free is. Oh, definitely yeah. is. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and then each each store or club also has this private forum. Yeah. So uh, I started a couple of comments, uh, a couple of forum topics, actually, uh, about a week and a half ago, just saying, hey, guys, this is what I would like to see from your battle reports, get them posted up. Everyone in our club can see it. Mm. Uh, you've also got leaderboards as well, which, again, feeds into that sort of friendly rivalry. Um, so you've got who's got the most number of uh, battle reports. You've mm -hmm. got the top commanders for points earned. Yeah. Um, you've got obviously the new recruits and then the most commended as well. And uh, yeah, I must have done a couple of good battle reports because my name there is shot straight to the top of the, the list. Yeah, well, joint top. Well, on the top commanders, but the most commended, and that's what it's all about, medals. Oh, yeah, it's all well, about medals and yeah, how far out you can get them yeah. on your chest. This isn't Russia, man. You, know, you, <laughs> you don't take your medals off your pajamas and put them onto your uniform during the day. It's not all about the medals. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely no, 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 not. No, no, no. no. Um, and then also down the bottom, you've got all the battle reports that uh, the whole club has done. So yeah. you can easily jump in and out and see how well uh, yourself did or your fellow yeah. commanders, um, you know, and, and obviously get it there. And what I like about, well, about the battle reports I mentioned now is some of the, the titles that people are doing. So this is just our club. But, yeah. you know, um, Z Mouse there did, has anyone seen the Sarge? You know, and you think that's got something happened in that battle yeah. report. Yeah. You, know? you, you can make them as historic or as um hollywood as you want for those times you can make them really i think that's what people are going for the hollywood yeah. definitely yeah. and it's a hook it, it grabs you straight away and you go oh, okay uh, what's this on about then yeah you know and it's quite nice because people are, are making them individual as well which is really great to see also i suppose if um if people have been playing and they've got something that's really stood out in that game then that can be the hook point that you know that, that of course yeah that changing moment that you can throw in there yeah absolutely and it's uh it's it's really nice to see that people are, are posting these battle reports as well they're coming in quite thick and fast on the various yeah. uh theater parts of it as we'll see and I, i've mm. only pulled sort of one from each week and each yeah. uh color line uh, so, route. well let's let's start the bidding then so the first ones we're going to look at are this um, was the week one red route yeah. for the Orn Bridge. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is currently locked off, these ones. They are, yeah. So you can't play any more battles and record them. You can still play battles for the global campaign, of yeah. course, but you can't record against victory or defeat um, yeah. to influence the overall strategy uh, anymore. But it's good to see what people have been up to and uh, and everything else. Sure. Uh, so this was a British versus Axis mm -hmm. uh, by uh, RJ Bayer, I think his name is on there. Mm -hmm. Probably on pronunciations all over, so I apologise in advance. Um, but he did a, a quite good battle report here, had quite a bit of text. He put his army list in, which you can just see on the link on the yep. right. So you can actually uh, 
download that at your leisure. Yeah. Um, and that'll bring up his army list for it. And then further on down uh, after his text, because he really went into detail here, which was really, really, really nice to see. Mm. Um, turn 10. Turn 10, yeah. It was, a, it was a long game, this one was, definitely. Nobody wanted to leave that one. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm not, not giving up now. Not when <laughs> I keep on putting the reinforcers yeah. in. Absolutely. Uh, so then reinforcements went in. But he's got a nice couple of pictures in there as well, which uh, is a nice little sort of table set up. Yeah. yeah, you can see that the, the guys have really had a good game there. Um, and I also like to see actually in some of these pictures what people have got in the background of the gaming rooms. I don't know if you, you've ever yeah. thought about Oh, yeah, we're, that. we're all nosy in the background. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's quite nice that he's also using here the beach mission terrain yeah. sort of pack um, that we did, which was the cardboard terrain with the printed map, hmm. um, specifically for the FUBAR mission and beach invasions. But um, I think a lot of people are actually using the German defences in their own games for other yeah. sort of scenarios and things. Um, which links in really nicely to him. In February, we'll be having a Bacage set as well, which is all cardboard 3D terrain. I've seen that they're pre glued as well. They're not. Yeah, actually... they literally just fold up and then yeah. they're ready to go. Yeah. And it's about 45 foot, I think, of Bacage, which is not bad on a 6x4 table. No. <laughs> and, well, this is the thing for the beach set is quite nice because people don't often play um, beach landing games. They maybe, you know, will play at D Day. So around June time, somebody yeah. will go, I'm going to dust that off and play it. So spending a lot of money on a load of beach defences uh, can often seem like a waste when you're not going to get constant use out of them. So yeah. being able to pick up a cheaper alternative with the little card packs is great. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and it was. It's a really nice set. It's really good cardboard as well that uh, the, the guys in New Zealand put together for us. And they've, they've sold very, very well to yeah. stores, clubs, individuals, everybody out there. So, yeah, we're very happy with it, and it's a nice set. Yeah. And then each report at the end as well has all these comments. So um, All American, I haven't actually haven't actually mentioned All American yet. He's actually the lead vocal yeah. American commander, I would say. Um, pretty much goes through most battle reports, gives his advice, and yeah. at the same time also gives his opinion, which is really nice. Hmm. And there's just a slew of people that jump in and obviously uh, have their say, and it's quite nice. It's an open forum, which yeah. is good, and everyone's treating each other very respectfully. There's no, you know, there's no bad vibes or evil vibes. No, I, I, I think in the green, grand scheme of things, people who have signed up for this campaign are all gamers and fans of the period and the game. So that that takes away a lot of the static that you might get in yeah. just a, a random forum for it. Whereas this this is just gamers wanting to see yeah. games being played. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, it's one of those as well where it's very uh, welcoming atmosphere I found uh, with people, you know, offering help and mm. everything else. And yeah, just, just very inclusive, isn't it? Which is always nice yeah. to see nowadays. Um, so what we got here, this is week one green sector. This yeah. is Karen Tan. Um, so I really like this one for the title straight away. Omaha Beach, the battle for Easy Green. And it was obviously the FUBAR mission that they yeah. did. Um, and this was a gentleman, James Westerfield. And I think he played his son reading through. His son came back from... Uh, from university, I think. Um, right. And they jumped in and got a game in. Really good battle report. This one, he put army lists in there, he put videos in there. I mean, you've got that whole beach assault the, the from... beach assault from... Yeah. Dave and Private Ryan, absolutely. Sets the scene quite well, I feel, yeah. <laughs> so as you read through, he uh, he tried a few different house rules. I think he used Sherman's with dozers that could clear certain obstacles, but not mines, you know, yeah. things like that. Um, and in the end, what he actually did is instead of using the old Normandy battle book, he actually went, yeah. actually, no, the, the, the American uh, mission for version four works a lot better. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's just, what he ended he, up using. Yeah, he took the layout from the old book. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and he's got his causeways coming off the beach. Yeah, and um, if you can see that, that he really has come very close to doing that layout from that book he has, on his and, own table. And the best thing about this, is we're just saying about the cardboard terrain. So in the middle there, he's actually got the German um, sort of mortar and tabrock yeah. pits. In cardboard, but then he's got the landing craft as the three D models, essentially. Yeah, the, the resins. Yeah, so it's a nice mix there, and he's also got obviously his, his uh, tanks and his duckers mm. and as well in there. But then the pre printed map that is the yeah. fold out map, I think there, or it might even possibly be the vinyl map. I can't quite see if I'm honest, but the point is he's got mm. a nice mix. He's got some three D terrain, some two yeah. D terrain. It works really well together. That's it. It works beautifully. Um, yeah. And it is. Yeah. It looks like a very close battle. I think it, uh, reading through it came down to the nth term, almost you yeah. know, to lose basically, uh, one way or another. Um, and he was saying that he couldn't get his troops to rally even on a three plus. Just could not get them to rally, and it just came stalemate on the uh, beach. I, I feel his pain. The, I played this. I played this in the the old Normandy campaign back yeah. when it first came out. And uh, and he says there after bombardment invasion prior to German turn one half of the DD tanks drowned. He got off much lighter than I did when I played this because <laughs> none of the tanks drowned. Every landing craft made it to the beach. 
they drifted into better positions than they'd been set up initially. <laughs> and the initial, the, the prior bombardment devastated my Germans so much so that I, by turn one, I'd almost lost. It was horrible. <laughs> Step one was grim. I, I demanded better. But that is a beautiful battle report. And he's really used the fact that if you put in a single picture, you can give text to the picture. Yes, so you don't which need, you links do, them together. Which links them, so you don't need to worry about writing a block of text. You can write it for the photo that you're adding. So it's more like a photo story than a... Than just a, a line of text. A, and a line of text and bottom. then a pic picture below. Yeah, yeah, which I admit, my first couple of battle reports were literally just text. Yep. And then a few pictures at the bottom, and people obviously said, well, you know, maybe you should improve it. And for a while, mm. I was like, oh, I don't quite know how to do that. I had to play with it. And it's only this morning you've told me there's actually a how-to guide on the, on the website. <laughs> there, there's a big button on the first page yeah. going, do you want to know how to do this? Do you want to know more? Mm. Uh, yes, I wish I had. So that, that proves if you read the rules, then you might actually be able to play the game. <laughs> well, yeah, that's terrific. I, I have a sneaking suspicion James Westerfield uh, is a, on tabletop viewer because I'm pretty sure I've seen him pop up in our forums Excellent. with that as his username. Oh, fantastic. So, so it's a bit of cross-platform yeah. and uh, uh, things there as well. So brilliant. Mm. Um, right, next up, we've got Colonel Frost and the uh, Drive Them Back to the Beach, this was. Um, so we played the Bridgehead scenario yeah. here for um, his blue route, this was, mm. for San Maria Glees. Um, again, really like this one. This was the first linked battle report. Yeah. So both players uh, submitted the battle and linked it. And the interesting thing about this one was they both um, had only done one battle report up to this point, obviously, that we're filming yeah. today. Yet Colonel Frost has actually got seven commendations just off this one battle report with yeah. an average rating of eight out of ten stars. So I'm kind of looking at it going, this must be a good battle report to have a yeah. read through. And it was, it was worth my time to read through. He had a, quite a bit of text at the beginning, which set the scene and gave uh, a story yeah. atmosphere to it. So it wasn't just turn one, this happened, turn two, this happened. Yeah, he's turned into a narrative. So with the smoke yeah. screen still in place, the 76 Shermans were forced to leave the safety of the hedges and come forward to spray lead on the advancing <laughs> infantry. Yeah. There's some good imagery in there. Yeah. I mean, I can see that happening straight away. You know? It's like a novelization. It's good. Yeah. And that's what I tried to do, but I'm, I'm nowhere near an author at all. Um but again, we've got the pictures. So um, we've got the pictures and the text under each one, which shows nice it. socks. Lovely socks. Got the scrim net in the background yeah. there. So I love looking in the background of people's pictures. Uh, you know, keep it clean. But uh, yeah. we love seeing the background as well. Um, and again, it's just a nice little table setup. He's got a central area. He's obviously mm. got the roads coming off of it. Um, so it showed that they 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 set the table up and then played a, a good game and you know got quite a bit of killing done, which is basically what it's all about. You know. Yeah. Um, now you were you were quite excited to see Kurt's card there from the command deck, weren't I you? Was, yeah. it's, it's always nice to see Kurt Knipsel. In <laughs> fact, I toyed with taking him whenever we were playing our game, and then yeah. went, "No, he should be on the Eastern Front, so I'm not going to." Uh, but it turns it. out you probably should have done then because uh, it wouldn't matter. The, the Tigers <laughs> never arrived anyway. That's a true point, actually. Yeah. yeah, I was quite I was quite impressed with that. Well, in yeah. that case, it may well have been Kurt leading them because <laughs> Kurt Kurt and Senior. Um, Officers did not get on particularly well. He, he had a quite a bugbear historically about certain things and people who he had to uh, fight alongside. So it's entirely possible he just went, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> We're not turning up for this yeah. battle. No, we'll wait till later. <laughs> yeah, again, got a ton of pictures in there, some really nice ones. Yeah, there is. And again, he's got that narrative at the beginning. He's also got the narrative through the pictures. So it's mm. a really nice battle report. And the Germans won um, for the blue route, which although the Allies ultimately took, yeah. it shows that all the points count because it did keep it really close yeah. um, as we went along there. So um, it was really nice to see. And it's just another nice little battle report, really, that, uh, yeah. that I noticed and thought worth mentioning. It's, it's interesting you say that about the um, the actual blue route. If I get back to... The actual theatres themselves. Mm -hmm. So where are we? Some Mary Glee. So yeah. if, if people have been paying attention, um, you can go back to any of the theatres and see where they actually sat. So you can see where people have got to. And in this case, there were 76 uh, Axis victories yep. against 70 US and nine British. So 79. So there's only three in that. It was three points, which is actually one win. Yeah. So it was one battle it came down to in the end, which and is incredible. You, and you can look at all of these. And even though the, the areas are locked off, you can still go back and have a look at these, not just for the battle reports, but also the um, specific missions that were available yes. are still in there as well. So if you want to go back and play things like the Bukaj country or the brew up or food bar whatever happens yeah. to be those full scenarios are, are still sitting available 
which um, is also good for anybody who might not have jumped into the campaign yet yeah. as well. So uh, I'm pretty sure there's pe uh, you know people out there, clubs and stores and even mm. individuals that haven't had a chance to start for whatever yeah. reason, you know, could be traveling, could be uh, family time or anything like that. Yeah. So it's good that they can go back, refight them, and maybe catch up with the rest of us as well, you know. Yeah. Or, I mean, with the things like the, the campaign pack, even though this website will be going down essentially after the the last week is finished mm -hmm. um but the the global campaign pack can be pulled out and played at any stage yeah um so getting the the pdf missions from here is is a great way of sort of expanding that and then um the campaign book itself yeah yeah which you have there has i do the, yeah the, uh bonuses for the specific areas yeah so they're still going to be available yeah, so we've got obviously everything in here. It's the bonuses that you're obviously more interested in. So you've got the likes of the red route there with the bonuses for each week and things yeah. like that. Um, and like you say, it's it, everything's in there that you need, so you can just pick it up and play. Mm. Um, and then obviously as part of that, we said about the, the terrain here and then also this ace campaign as well. Yeah. So that's something you can pick up separately as a pack, but you can then play another campaign but using these missions. And, sure. I haven't yeah. actually looked at the Omaha campaign pack yet. Uh, is there much in there? Because I, yeah. I've seen it's a... Yeah, it uh, is. Sort of so clump it's, of... the idea is it's another way to play uh, Late War for version 4. Yeah. Um, so the bloody Omaha basically breaks it, breaks it down into infantry and armoured um, lists. What you do is take a commander, upgrade the commander for every time they win a battle. They're yeah. getting rewards, essentially, that improve um, their army, their units, or even make the enemy worse in certain battles. Yeah. Uh, works very well with the Hobby League kit. So yeah. for anybody who's doing Hobby League through a club or a store as well, they can build that into it. Um, or off the back of the global campaign, is like, it's sort of smaller skirmish-type games. So you may be not running 100 points. It could be just running at 50-point games. Um, but it's just another layer and another way to play. Mm. Um, and then you have specific missions in there as well that you can use. So it is a really great pack, actually. And it's something we tried down at the Battlefront Club when yeah. we were first training. <laughs> I use that word, but in training, ready for I, the global like campaign. That. Killing it's, time, really. It's, it's much easier to train for that than it is to train for, like, a marathon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. or even real war, you know. But oh, at the end of the yeah, day, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to have to run around too much if I can help it. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> I, thankfully I managed to dodge most of that by being above the draft age. Things would have to go very badly wrong at this stage. Um, so that was week one. Week one's locked. Now, yep. as, as we stand at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, we're on the final day of week two. So yep. by the time people at home see this, uh, these sections will be locked as well. But you've gone through and, and had a look at each of the uh, the areas to, to pluck out yeah, something as well. Yeah, just to pluck something out yep. of people that we like or, or anything that we've seen that's really nice. Yeah. Yep. So the first off the bat then is um, Neujatat. Yeah, so... And Mibilis, Mibilis, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm guessing there's pauses or apostrophes or something in there. Could could be MB Bellius. Yeah, so this was a really nice battle that I saw again. Um, it's another link report. Yeah. So again, both commanders have put in their battle for it and uh, linked it. It was 75 points. So it's a slightly smaller game, very similar to what we did. Um, yeah, uh, in our game, although this is obviously on a different route. So this was the red route for the Villas Bocage. Mm. Um, which, if I remember rightly, this is actually the, uh, is this the Time for a Brew um, campaign? Uh, it probably is, the, yeah. Yeah, so you start in the middle of the board and everything starts pinned down or bailed yeah. out. And it's a whole new level to play. It's a different way of playing. So you have to get everyone mounted up. You have to get into your tanks to do some damage. Again, great little board that he did for the Villas Bocage there. Um, and obviously put in yeah, I like some nice trees and things. I don't know if they played two separate games here. Because that clearly yeah. is them moving through the countryside, whereas this is Villa Bukash itself. Yeah, so I think reading the battle report from what he said, he's basically he um he did he set up two games and played two and, separate and games to link into games, it. Yeah. yeah. Um which just extended that time that he was playing out as well. And yeah. made it a slightly different mission as he went. Um but great seeing the photos of his actual army as well, which I've not seen on any of the battle reports so far. Yeah. So he's got his units with his unit cards, um, just to show this is what I've took, et cetera, et cetera. You know? Yeah. We've got um, the uh German and British both do that. So yeah, that's quite nice. so it's, it's just great. It's it's not just an army list. It's taking that one step further yeah. again. And it's something I might try and emulate in my battle reports just to show this is exactly what I took, you know, yeah. so that people can use that as ideas. I mean, one of our forums the other day, I was saying, do I need M10s in my army? M10 tank destroyers, are they the way forward? And someone went, yes, why have you not taken them already? And then I was talking to you last night and you were like, yeah, these are really good. And there's a way of taking more of them. Oh, okay, mm, tell yeah. me about this, you know. Yeah. Especially with the, um, they've, they have essentially the German double move, so you can yeah. blitz out and shoot and scoop back. 
Yeah, and yeah. They've got a 40-inch range, I want to say. So they out, or if it's not 40, it's 36. They definitely outrange pretty much every Everything other gun. Everything on board, yeah. And coming from ambush, it sounds like the yeah. way forward, oh, yeah. God, they're, they're for the beautiful. points, For the points in the game, it's yeah, something I'm definitely going to be looking at. Um, so it's good to sort of show your army, this yeah. is what I did take, this is where it went wrong. Maybe you could try something different yeah, or yeah. someone can go, actually, I would have tried this different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's my thought process. Well, yeah. yeah. And it's nice to see because... Um, if you haven't played a game in a specific area yet, if you haven't played a specific mission, but maybe you're thinking about playing yeah. that specific, if somebody's put one up already, it's and good you to get the intelligence and you can look at it. it and you go, oh, he fell down because of this, this, and this. He fell down because he didn't read the scenario properly. <laughs> don't, well. don't, don't know who that could have happened to. <laughs> um, but it's it's really handy to, to go, oh, I can, I can take these ideas, not just for how to lay out my battle report when I'm finished, but how to play the game. Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Get, get, get ideas, get tip because I find when I'm playing, I play with a very small group mm. and we play the same way, um, more or less. And because you're always playing the same people, yes, yeah. you have a tendency to fall into uh, a rut where you won't think outside of your local meta. Yeah, and what you actually know or have yeah. played before, yeah. And, and then the minute then you turn around and you see somebody else going, well, I've taken this and this, and you're going, well, I never take those because of X in my club. And then he uses it in some way that you would never have thought. And you're yeah. going, actually, I could now see a reason to change up my list and to take those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a perfect example of that was uh, the other night I was playing and the, uh, the British commander actually mm. brought in his Kitty Hawks. And I was like, Planes are quite good, actually. So I went and bought some Thunderbolts. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah. Don't tell the wife, but yeah, I got lots of Thunderbolts ready it's, to come into the battle. <laughs> it's, it's weird that uh, play, planes is one that very few of my, my group use planes, but yeah. I always take anti-aircraft anyway. And, yeah. they, and they go, why? Well, because the time when I don't take it is the time everybody will show up with planes. And secondly, if I turn six dice of ACAC per you know, half track yeah. onto infantry. Infantry have a tendency to go away. They're very good anti infantry, especially dug in infantry. So even yeah. if nobody has planes, they're, st they're not they're completely there redundant. To go. Yeah. You know, yeah. You can, you can still use it. That is a big battle report. It is. And um, this was one where I was scrolling, scrolling, scrolling yeah. just to find out who won at the end of yeah. it as well, um, all the way down. But yeah, he had lots and lots of pictures on this one. Mm. It was definitely worth it. And some really nicely painted models as well, which yeah. is always nice. Uh, you know. I I think we looked through um, Nojitat's project on the site a couple of weeks ago when, yes. he, was, when he was still working on it and uh, he was trying to decide how to do the ca uh, camo pattern for the, the Stugs originally. So yeah. even things like the rear of the side skirts are still in all the red oxide, so there's no uh, camo I remember, those. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And it was that level of detail. I was like, actually, that's, that's really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really nice slash insane. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's... The uh, red line then? Yes, that is indeed. So that's the uh, Villas Bacage. Um, for the week two for the green, it was uh, San Lo, or still is San Lo for yeah. us at the moment. Uh, so this was the fuel depot. So uh, mm. we were actually looking through this a minute yeah, ago. I've, scro <laughs> I've scrolled down because I was being nosy. So this was uh, Ian Pachel. He did the uh, basically attacking a fuel depot. Yeah. Um, so he actually got some maps into here, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. Some overview pictures as well. Um, and then he had the alternate perspectives on each turn as well. So, um, so, yeah, he's actually period map. There, yeah, he's, he looks like he's taken it straight out of a, a book. Yeah. And then he's actually managed to mirror that quite well with his terrain setup. Of how he's done it, yeah. yeah. He's got the railroad at the bottom there um, and obviously got the, the town centre, um, which is just really nice. Yeah. And it just it shows, that uh, again, another attention to detail with the historical side yeah. of it, you know. Which I, I, I'm a sucker for that myself. I will spend... A long, long time and getting as close to possible as as I can to uh, actual map setup. Yeah, and there have been times in the past where I've spent more time setting up a game only to be routed off the uh, <laughs> turn the, one and been yeah, tabled. Yeah, yeah to, you know, hammered so badly it hurt. <laughs> um, but it's nice. It's nice to see that attention to detail. I wonder if he actually took it to his list as well. Um, if you tried to follow the the organisation that was there, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't get a chance to look too much, but um, it was just the pictures that caught me. I mean, these yeah. rangers here attacking the uh, the gun position was was quite evocative mm. of things, and they were very nice painted. But it'd be good to have a look at the the army list that you yeah. took, definitely. Yeah, and again, some beautiful paint jobs there. That, yeah, that ambush camo is. Um, yeah, great. I love the fact he's got you know triangles as well as dots on top yeah. of the p p pattern, you know, and p dot pattern. 
and it's just lovely painted, you know. And considering these are fifteen millimeter scale as well, that's that's yeah. attention to detail right there. It really is. Um, so it was a U.S. victory, which is another reason I obviously pulled it out, being yeah. a, 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 yeah, a, a U.S. Yeah. player, of course. Um, Filthy in theater. Oh well, what can I say? I mean, you know, <laughs> we might have been late to the war, but we got we arrived. Germania for the Germanians. <laughs> Uh, but again, he's got all the comments at the bottom yeah. there, as you've seen, and uh, everyone's, you know, commending it because they liked it and it was a good one. Um, mm. let's say people are getting 10 stars on this one. So this was actually yeah. a, a really good battle report. I think he averaged quite high on this as well, star wise. So I'd have liked more pictures. Since Alexander <laughs> going, you'd be hard pressed. I mean, that's, that's quite a few, that's at least one picture a turn. Oh, so, easily. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 And it's good that people are remembering to take photos because I forget. Yeah. Every time. I'm not going to lie. And that's because I'm getting involved in it and I'm rolling the dice and then I'll go, oh, I need to take some photos. Yeah, I should have got that done. Yeah. On occasion, I go the other way where I start taking pictures and then I never actually put them up anywhere. Even for things when I'm not part of a campaign, yeah. I have to have a tendency to take pictures of games and then the uh, the pictures just sort of sit there yeah. on my phone until I get around to deleting them. <laughs> um, I'm just curious as to see where we're currently sitting for for these theatres. So yeah, so currently, San Lo. 67 for the axis, 53 and 6 is 59, 69. 69 so there's two 60, points two in it. Points in so it's that. either two draws for the Germans and they will draw, yeah. uh, well, give or take a couple of points, or one win and it tip it over. And tip it. Yeah. So, like this I said, is, this is literally the, the last, last day. day. So uh, there, there may be some reports go in here after we finish. That might filming. just do it, yeah. But I'm pretty sure that they're ready to uh, hit the update. But again, you can see, you know, started a, one or two missions, yeah. then it shot up, and then it's just got higher and higher, and there's just more and more battles being fought. And I think I've seen, personally speaking, without seeing the actual data as such, but over the weekend, there is a lot more yeah. battles going on, people playing, <laughs> people, sense. yeah. But it does, it, it shoots right up, and you get a lot, lot going for it. Yeah, but even, I mean, even today, and I say today because this could potentially have been yesterday for us depending on time zones so yes. people were putting there were seven went in today eight in total for yesterday so yeah already we, we, we were on quarter past 12 and already we've had yeah seven battle, so reports. Seven battle reports although potentially they could have come from the future in australia or yes and yet they never sent me the lottery results but yeah so it's still very tight and we'll take a look then at uh, our final yeah, thread, so I suppose. This so this is uh, the Blue Roof Sherborg, and this yeah. is actually the battle report I put. A very, very basic battle report, and I've been talking them up, mm. um, but yours are my game. So I just got a little bit of text in there, yep. um, and I did this in the hotel last night. I'm very limited Wi-Fi, so I'm impressed. surprised it came I'm, out. I'm impressed you got any Wi-Fi. I know. generally have to bring it over with you <laughs> or carry it in a bucket. But, yeah. I did try, but they wouldn't let me on the plane with it. No, shame. Um, so I got a couple of close-up pictures of our game, uh, and mm. obviously threw in there with the 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 text under each picture um and obviously that's a lot of burning sherman 76 mils yeah. there almost like you were targeting them i don't, well, I don't know why because anytime i stopped you shot me with them <laughs> um and then the final picture of the game was uh me taking the objective, taking the objective yeah. put a nice bit of text at the bottom but the point of showing you this really was mm. this is obviously a live one so i yeah. can move stuff up and down like you said um i can link about a report to an opponent with uh, the the text as yep. well and it's that code there you can give mm -hmm. um all i have to do is put a video in and put some armor lists on i've got the full xp available for that uh yeah for that battle report what what a shame the video won't be i know done, it's and then in, done time. in time i mean yeah. it's a shame really yeah, but it really no is. you know in terms of xp it's dead easy to get it shows your you know your commanders <laughs> that you're you're worth if if people Being have there. yeah if people have the competency to do videos um yeah and i'm i'm terrible with technology but even i had a little youtube channel where i managed to ham out videos on occasion but it could be something as simple as um it doesn't need to be a full video turn by turn yeah you there are free software available for things like um audacity which is a a voice software mm. that literally you can just download audacity for free there's a couple of youtube tutorials showing you how to do it and you could just upload um pictures an image gallery to youtube yeah and then just voice over as you go so you can put up a, an image and then after 10 seconds change to the next image and you can just talk through what just happened comment on it just com commentate yeah, just, even exactly yeah. and just comment uh as you go through and then do that and upload that and that gives you a little thing because sometimes people won't read a wall of text yeah um which confuses me but some people don't like reading <laughs> um I, weirdly i've seen people go the other way where they go i don't like watching videos i'd much rather have the text so i can yeah. skip them okay um so all things to everybody so even if you're not 
standing with a, a, a camcorder and if that's still what they're called these days, or I suppose phones do it. I think more people would be using phones, yeah. yeah Ease of yeah, access, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Well, not for me. <laughs> um, box brownie, perhaps, or hand crank would do me. <laughs> but yeah, so you don't need to be recording every dice roll, every um, play of the game. You don't need to have a camera in one hand and be throwing the dice right, in the, the other. other. It could be something as simple as just a, a photo narration yeah. uh, and then pop that up because people enjoy seeing things like exactly. that. Exactly. It's more content for people yeah. to interact with and look at and everything else. Um, or even do what the likes of even myself is doing, just put little YouTube videos and links to YouTube that yeah. other people have put up of, uh, I put the other day, a World War II victory parade in New York. And yeah. it was like, yeah, I've won the battle. Let's get the victory parade in there. Yeah, you know, yeah, just exactly. wantonly take someone else's content if well, needs to be. It, it gives you the whole feel for the battle report then because you're not just um, you're not just getting the battle report, you're getting the sense of of, you know, the hard fought victory and then the uh, the spoils, I suppose. Essentially, yeah, 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 yeah. No, indeed. So it's good. it's just good. Basically, yeah. it, it points out that you can constantly update these battle reports each week as well. Yeah. That you're on that section. Um, so if you want to, you know, you need to add some more pictures or some more text or someone's even mentioned. Maybe you should have some more pictures. You know, yeah. Jump in there, or even if you like me, horrendous with technology and the pictures never load. Get onto a better Wi-Fi connection or, or if, you know, yeah. Well, it, actual cables nowadays. People still use cables. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying nothing. My, my pictures, it doesn't matter if the Wi-Fi is good or not because none of my pictures are in focus. Um, the other thing is until you link a battle report, you can still go in and amend it. Yes. So you can still add bits and pieces of additional content later on. Yeah. Um, I'm just having a quick look here. So obviously this is still the end of week two. Yeah. Um, but one of the things we haven't really talked about is the bonuses per yep. sector. Yes, so the speak. sector bonus for if your side, uh, for yeah. want of a better word, controlled the sector previously. So week one, the Allies, it was a clean sheet. Yeah. So for week two, everybody did get that bonus, and it's it's, yeah. it's something that you're looking at. So that was just here, wasn't it? Yeah, so um, we had uh, the opportunity for you to actually be the defender against the Germans in yes. our battle because you get to choose to be the attacker or defender, yeah. even though the, the scenario was written as the, as the uh, historical... Allies being the Allies attacker. attacker and access or defense. Mm. Um, but because you have the opportunity, you could then play it as a German counterattack yeah. uh, instead on a, on a holding area. If you wanted to, which does flip the mission, of course. It, it does. Head. And depending on the game um, scenario and your actual army that you have, you may favor. I mean, if somebody's playing a very infantry heavy list, they probably don't want to have to run across half the board. Yeah, just sitting, to get there. Sitting in defense is much better for a big infantry force. So having those sector bonuses yeah. sitting and being able to pick and choose what you use. And I mean, they're very different because for uh, for the blue sector, you had that choice of attacker defender. I think uh, red sector after Orn got five points per 50 points of yeah, force. So, so a 100 point game, you're looking at 10 extra points. That's, That's a lot. That is beefy that is very beefy and it's actually yeah. something that you could use to upgrade a unit so yeah. for example the paratroops are 11 points base if you took a larger platoon it's 13 so you could actually have three platoons at six points extra to your army list and you still got four to play with yeah and i mean you know this also shows then what people are going to be running into next week so whoever mm -hmm. owns this uh when it closes today the um, force will gain an extra five points of command cards for fighting in blue sector next week. And again, week. five points of command cards is actually quite a lot. Sticky bombs alone for the paratroops is yeah. two points. And that's for each unit. So actually, you could have two units with sticky bombs. I'm just you working know. out. That's 81 playing 81. That's a dead heat at the moment. That could even be a draw. Yeah, in which case nobody gets to play there. Dun, dun, dun. Well, there is rules for draws, obviously, in, yeah. in here. So. Yeah. That's something that we'd have to write up at HQ in the sky, uh, mm. have to make the decision on which way it's going to go. Yeah. But essentially, I mean, it's it's so close. It's ridiculous. I mean, I might yeah. have to quickly jump on in a second and do another Blue Rock Battle Report. Uh, <laughs> Quick, let's play a game. Let's don't, go. Don't worry. I, I have a battle report that I haven't logged yet where I was playing as the Allies. And funnily enough, I got beat in that as well. So that would be a Blue Victory or <laughs> Axis Victory. So I, I, can, I can marry that off if I need to. Um, so that brings us into week three. Yes. So sort of halfway down the line, and it does look like it's it's very close, not just in the amount of games being played and, and the sort of the split of victories, but where they're going. We haven't really seen one section go hell for leather going, oh, I'm just going to play in Carrington, I'm going to play yeah. in Warren. It's very it's spread out. People are being very selective in where they mm. put it, um, which shows the, the sort of 
not quite a full command and control, but there's definitely a, a high command on both sides who are yes. being very selective from where people go. I mean, personally, I can't speak for the Axis because I'm not actually in the Axis yeah. forum. Um, and I mean, other than, you know, sort of arm twisting somebody to tell me the truth, mm. I couldn't tell you, but I, I definitely do see that myself. Yeah. So from a commentary point of view, there has to be somebody overall effort, which is quite, you know, it's good because it means that there's uh, an overall command and control that is getting yeah. people okay, we need help over here, or can we get some more battles over here? Or, hey, guys, play this mission, because yeah, this is yeah. what I need for the next sector bonus or something yeah. like that, you know? Um, so, yeah, it is moving into week three, and there's going to be some nice uh, nice battles that are going on for week three. Um, I'm quite excited to try the red route, actually, Hill 112. Yeah. Um, just the name itself. I mean, there's not going to be any spoilers, um, so you will have to go on, log on, and get the uh, the missions yeah. for it. Um, but Hill 112, it's just evocative of a, of a cool battle somewhere, isn't it, you know? Yeah. Um, although it's technically the the British route, I I'm quite happy to take my American armoured over there. They just got lost on the off the way off the beach. They turned left, not right. An awful lot of people got lost coming yeah. off those beaches. Anyways, <laughs> let's face it, a lot of people got lost trying to find the beaches where yeah. where people ended up was not where they were supposed to be. So <laughs> yeah, it should be it should be exciting uh, yeah. to see where it goes. It, even though the Allies have had, um, I'm not going to say a crushing victory. Because they, they they closed down those sectors in week one, yeah. But they closed it down by the skin of their teeth. Points. In places it was literally two or know, three points. Yeah, I think a game yeah. here, a game there would mm. have changed things massively. And it looks like week two could lock down, being again very tight either way. Yeah, it's skin um, of the teeth stuff. This is at the yeah. moment. It's uh, it's it's quite dramatic. I mean, it, I'm yeah. like, you know, but it's good to see. It's great to watch actually. It, it's fantastic, and I'm very very keen to to get a few more games in against. Mm -hmm opponents who don't know the rules quite as well and, and hope, <laughs> try and introduce some children maybe is that your club. sector bonus for you yeah, then that that's, my, the, that is, that that's the initiative you've got yeah I, I think i'll play warren a few times unfortunately warren's uh, warren's germans i was using uh yesterday when we played because the americans are actually mine that was the excuse you were going to tell me right i well, get no, it you had, one more, you, had, you had one more point remember you were playing 76 against my 75 oh right yeah uh, that was uh, it as uh, well and uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and my dice you used my dice. i used your dice Screaming as well Eagles dice. i mean what can i say you know yeah. i had a Odds, really? odds were all in my favour. Really, we should have put that down as my victory. <laughs> when we think about it, realistically. Ah, oh, the battle's exactly. going to be locked in after test. I can't oh, change it. Sorry, right. I mean, I yeah, tried. That is a shame. Don't <laughs> worry. I, I know the coders will take that out. Um, so the last thing we have up here before we move on then is just to show the sort of spread of, of people who are getting involved with Absolutely, the global yeah. campaign. So we've got a nice uh, overview of the globe here. This is the globe of the global campaign. Yeah, and it really is a spread I yeah. mean, from, uh, well... I would be disappointed if there was not a pin <laughs> in New Zealand. I'll just say that right off the bat. Absolutely. So we've got, yeah, the club in New Zealand at there, the HQ in obviously yeah. New Zealand, the studio there. Uh, we've also got the Malaysian uh, factory as yeah. well. So that little red one there. And if you click on each of the things, it will just come up with a yeah. short summary of it. Um, and then obviously you can click on that even mm. for, for more in detail. Well, I'm, I'm, South Africa I'm, I'm are represented gonna, there. Going to be interested there. So three yeah. plus war gaming in uh, Johannesburg. Absolutely. And I've, uh, I, I know there's a store in Cape Town as well that are waiting yeah. to log on. They're a little bit behind because they're still just doing the hobby league oh, right. at the moment. So yeah. when they finish the hobby league, they're going to jump into the global campaign. Um, so hopefully I'm going to see them jumping in there cool. as well. We've even got Tenerife as well, just here off the coast of Africa. Tenerife. I think, uh, Las Palmas. There you go in Spain, yeah. seven players playing down there. So, Sun, sea, and flames of war. It's well, it, it's much better than uh, our <laughs> current weather. We're, we're <laughs> in danger of being washed away. Yeah, I could get wet feet. Almost swam here this morning yeah. to see you. Uh, uh, Twelve players up in Reykjavik. Yeah. So uh, Iceland is where Bernie it's at. Bridges are definitely where it's at. And yeah. a little shout out to Iceland actually, because all American. Uh, the player I was talking about earlier, yeah. he's he's from Iceland. All right, smashing. and I think he's part of the uh, Polar Bear Gaming Club. Um, so the Polar Bears actually run a tournament every January, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to convince my boss to let me go um, out the office for a, a little while to visit yeah. Iceland and see our compatriots and do a tournament up there with them. Um, but there's a big scene up there, 12 people. I mean, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of people playing. It's poor, poor fella all the way north in Norway. <laughs> he's probably snowed in by this stage, so I, I think imagine. that's probably why he's, he's on his own at the yeah. moment, yeah. But he's registered, that's the important bit, yeah. so he's registered to start playing. <laughs> Um, and away you go. And then obviously you've got a yeah. smattering in Europe. The US and Canada are, are starting to get their clubs. So, you yeah. know, a bit of a shout out to our friends across the pond. Y you know, let's not be late to two world wars, guys. You know, um, <laughs> ooh, ooh, that's harsh. it. The gauntlet's thrown down now. You know, the, the UK office are there. So the American office have also got uh, a, a pin there in, in Maryland. Um, but we've basically also got uh, yeah. a few stores and clubs as well. 
Uh, and the important thing to bear in mind here is it's um, it's the friendly local gaming stores yeah. that are, you know, running a lot of these events as well. So even if you're not part of a club, go down to your local store and see if they're doing it. Um, it could be that you just don't know that they, mm. they're in there. Maybe their, you know, their poster on the wall they've took down because they've started the campaign. But just have a chat with them. Yeah. Because as we all know, talk to the manager and you'll find out where the local clubs are or even if they're playing the store. And you can still get involved, still play games. I tell you, I mean, I, even though they may not be advertising it, if you go down there and you're playing a game against the mate, at that point, that's when people come out of the woodwork going, oh, I play as well. Yeah, and, yeah. And you may find yourself a few new opponents that way. Well, even yeah. if it's not Flames of War and you're actually playing tanks, because the uh, the tanks game, the yeah. you know, very skirmish-based game with uh, small platoons, can be played in this campaign as well. They do have their own separate missions, yeah. um, and you can play any points, or 50, 100, 150, I think. I, I saw the crazy, crazy people playing 300 points of tanks. And I was like, that's a lot. You, let's play Flames of War, but no, they like the rules. They like the yeah. uh, simplicity of rolling the dice. So, yeah, Don't want any wrong. terrible infantry getting in the way of their <laughs> little tanks. <laughs> the tanks charging through the Vacage, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so they played some really good games on there, and uh, it all links into the campaign, of course, because yeah. you know there were battles where there was no infantry; it was mainly tanks. Yep. There were some battles where it was all infantry, no tanks. So uh, it's however you want to play it, really. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's a good representation. Everyone's playing. It's the, the key message here is just to get back in there yeah. and, and see who's who's playing in your local area and get some games in. Keep Doesn't matter where you away. play. Yeah. You know. So yeah, keep on trucking. So I think that was uh, all I've got to show you today. Yeah. I mean, how are you finding the campaign yourself? Are you enjoying what you've played so far? I, I am enjoying what I've played, yeah. Um, I am always enjoy whatever I'm playing anyway because <laughs> I'm like that. Um, I like getting games on the table. Uh, yeah. So it's, like I say, I've two of the people who came to the um, boot camp we had in June who hadn't played any um, Flames of War at all. Yeah. Um, one of them hadn't played any Historics before he came to the boot camp. So we've played a few games in the, the Hobby League and um, they're actually from, well, one's from Belfast and the other one's from Armagh. So for people outside Northern Ireland, it's about an hour and a half, two hours away from Armagh right. to here. Um, so once a month they're coming down and that once a month is this Saturday coming. So half the day will be spent um, getting mm. some games in for uh, for our own version of the, uh, the, the campaign, the campaign yeah. as well. So um, I think that'll be at least... Uh, well, I think Paul has got Americans, but I might be British. I'm not sure which way he went in the end, but Robert's definitely got Germans, and then I can yeah. play either. Um, so so we're trying to avoid blue on blue to, just to, to keep the feel for it, yeah. which isn't something that people have to worry about, but I, I like to, to flip back and forth anyway, so course, it doesn't, yeah. really, doesn't really matter to me. Um, but it just means that some of our... Uh, I occasionally will cross the stream, so to speak. I've only got one registered accounts so only registered for access right. uh, which means whenever i'm playing as the americans i'm just a, a, a throwaway so there won't be any links from my side on, yeah, on that yeah. one but uh, it keeps things interesting for the others let's put it like that yeah absolutely mm. it's like the same with me i i only play americans because I, I i genuinely love the american um army and as much as i'm throwing the gauntlet down for them mm. um to, to get into the scenario, you know, I, I, I love playing the Americans with the paratroopers and the armoured and even the, uh, the assault companies. And yeah, I just can't wait for the next few books to come out in the later on in the uh, the late war campaign. So I'm very much American through and through. Um, but that doesn't stop me playing the odd game with yeah. Germans and, you know, borrowing an army here and there. And actually, I'm looking at getting Falschmeager as my next army just because they're airborne. Again, I can't like that feel. So um, it's also the, that springboard to, to jump in and maybe start a new army, yeah. you know, and things like that. So... Good things, dude. Really good things. Cool. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you again. Um, Thank you for having me, dude. Good luck for the next four weeks of the campaign, I suppose. Yeah. So week three onwards. And uh, we're going to move on here, folks. If you haven't already got involved in the global campaign, it's never too late. Uh, even if you don't join us for the online part, uh, but if you're into Flames of War or Tanks, you can still get the, the campaign pack and give it a go with your own group, your yeah. own club in the new year, or whenever you get into it. So it's... It's always there as a as an option. It's not just stuck solely to these six weeks that we're playing it. Yeah, so it's interesting to see that uh, swing back and forth between the Axis and Allies, mm -hmm. and it, it's still very, very close. So we're into the, well, we're going into the final third now, the last two weeks of the, the global campaign. Where, yeah. about, what, where are we headed next, Lloyd, or what's his phase five? Isn't it? We're going in phase five next week. Mm-hmm. 
And then the week after that, we're going to phase six, and that is the final phase. So we're Ooh. so we're almost done. Uh, yeah, as of Monday, we'll be down to two weeks. Yeah, nice. At the time of recording, it's six five to the Allies, but obviously we haven't locked off um, this week's this week's run yet. So yeah. that'll, that'll come in early next week. Yeah. So it, it's very much all to play for. If you're watching this on Saturday or Sunday or even Monday, you still have the chance to nip in and make an <coughs> make an impact and effect because yep. we'll be locking and updating and going into the next phase on Tuesday. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely pop into your forums, either your Axis or Allied forums and, and ask uh, ask around, see where those battle reports are best best placed. If you've lost one, obviously throw it into somewhere where you're losing heavily so it doesn't <laughs> impact if you want to put it into somewhere where you're going to do some good. It's, this is this is the point where you get strategic and tactical about where you actually log those results. And that leads us nicely into the part of the show where you get strategic and tactical mm. about where you lodge your cash on Kickstarter. Yeah. Dun, dun. Nice. I see. I like that. It's good. Kickstarter watch time. And we have two doozies for you. Mm. One, the first one, is one that we have been waiting for for a long time. Jerry has been basically rubbing myself against people. Yes. Uh, to say, <laughs> have you heard about this? Yeah. You need to hear about this. Yeah. You need do, to know about yeah, this. You run around you the know. office going, do you want to clash spears with me? Yeah. 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 No, it, it, as well as that, can I just say, mm. I'm assuming that this was at Historicon? That, yeah, I played this at Historicon. Yeah, because yeah. it was pretty much all you've spoken about since you came back from Historicon. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there yeah, we go. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't see we are, that. of course, talking about the Clash of Spears from dun, Alvaro dun, dun. and Francisco Iris. 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 Yeah. yeah. Or Fighting Hedgehog, as it's much easier to pronounce. Fighting Hedgehog. Fighting Hedgehog. Um, this, is a, this is a historical clash game. Mm. Jerry's been bouncing up and down about it. He's absolutely in love. Alvaro and Francisco, you have the love of a giant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boys, you, you really do. Um, uh, he also has a, a, a lot of love from our own community because these are two long-standing community members within Beast of War slash on tabletop. Yeah, they've um, been floating in and out of our forums for years now. Um, and they went and they made a game that is incredible. Yes, yeah, by all much accounts, so. very and, much, so. and doing very well on Kickstarter too. I think they had a, they were trying to raise about five grand. They're now like thirty, forty grand in. So. Yeah, so so they were attempting to raise five thousand of the finest dollar. Pounds, yeah, uh, and they're currently at about forty-five thousand dollars. So, uh-huh. so they've they've smashed their goal for congratulations for um, printing the game, and they've been going from there. So, they announced this set of clash counters. Quote quote quote. Well, just mm-hmm. before you get into the counters, yeah. what are they actually raising money for here? Rulebook, well, is it? Well, yes. They the main source of it is the Clash of Spears rulebook, mm-hmm. um, which is this delightful affair here. Ta-da. Uh, so it's a 150-page historic warband skirmish game. I'm going to say skirmish because it's it's got a lot of um, non-skirmish aspects in it. You can form up. You can form sort of shield wall type affairs. Um, but it's, it comes down to the tactical choices that you make when you play because unlike some of the other skirmish games out there where... If you run across some open ground, you're fine. If you run some across some broken ground or through a forest, you might just reduce your range. In this, you have to deal with the fact that you're carrying armor. Heavy armor troops going through that open ground are grand. Heavy armor troops going through a forest or across rough, uneven ground become fatigued. They get slowed down. They become worse at fighting, whereas light troops are more able to move across that ground and still activate and, and react as normal so yeah. the whole idea about it is your war band you yes you can move people into difficult terrain if you want to but they're not going to be as effective yeah, and at that point a penalty for that. at that point lighter trips will come and hamstring you i have questions you ask your questions I and questions. i will One do my best is, to answer does it matter about the base size no Yes, it, I like this already. So this this has caused people consternation uh-huh. because they've actually got um, Vitrix are doing six sets. They've only managed to get three sets for the initial Kickstarter, mm-hmm. but uh, Vitrix are on board to do three more sets at least um, for them. So, so they've got Vitrix on board. Vitrix are on board. A little bird tells me uh, that foreground. Yeah, could yeah. Be so on board on this as well. So, so, so Vitrix come with no bases. Mm-hmm. currently because 
it's basic agnostic and people go, oh, but you need bases, you know, but we don't want to, if we tell people that it's no bases and you can use whatever you've got if you've got stuff based anyway, it doesn't matter. Yes. Even multi-based, that's all fine. And then the minute you go, we should, we we're going to supply some bases with it, then people will start going, but these are official bases. Oh, yes, yeah. So, so they've, they've, yeah. They've, they've been desperately trying to not add bases in. There is a base stretch goal. It's so far, so far in the future, I think it's like $90,000 for the mm. base in the stretch goal mark. Oh, no, it's only 50000 There we go. Bases for everyone. Yeah. Um, I, I, oh, my God, they're square. They, they are square, <laughs> which is great. Um, yeah. So... Foreground are going to do their bases. They're also, um, they've done uh, counters, fatigue markers, yeah. that Should sort of thing. Back up to these yeah. tokens. Uh, and this this sort of snuck out because it wasn't a stretch goal. Um, it appeared as a hidden stretch goal. So once they have 45 grand, they went, well, we're going to do these tokens. Uh, you're all going to get them. We had mentioned it before because we've been working behind the scenes with foreground. Uh -huh. And not just on the bases and the tokens, foreground are going to be designing a whole set of terrain for them oh, as well. Yes. Um, for your ancient Roman, Egyptian, Punic, sort of Carthage, Greek, oh, whatever happens. You know, God. all of these sort of uh, a Roman eras, fort. A Roman <laughs> fort. May, may say a Roman mile fort. Um, so these are coming from foreground as well. So I think. We've been told we can announce it. I don't know if anybody else will know before we've announced it. So this could be an exclusive, in which yeah. case, well done us. Um, so yeah, so Foreground are partnering up with Fighting Hedgehog and uh, Metrics to uh, to round out your world, I essentially. Have, I have more questions, mm. right? So my bases don't, uh, base sizes base don't, don't matter at all. Don't matter, no. I could even multi-base if I wanted to. You could even multi-base. And one of the things we were talking about... Can you multi-base, though, if yeah. you can go in and out of... And now, as long as you can mark that you're not in a formation. So if you've got, let's say you've got a unit of eight yeah. and you've got two bases of four and if they're in a formation, you put them side by side, square completely. And if they're not, then you just put them slightly ajar. Mm -hmm. Or if you want a base, one up as a four, one as a, a, a couple of twos and then a couple of singles so that you're not having to move eight mm -hmm. individual men, you can move them in a little rough grip or then rank them all up. The other thing is some things can't rank up. So somebody suggested in uh, in the forum that, well, if the things that can rank up are on squares, so you can have your nice tidy square formation mm -hmm. and when they're not, you break them apart and the stuff that can never rank up, you just put on round bases. Mm -hmm. And then that way it's very easy if you're teaching somebody who hasn't played before, going, well, can they rank up? Are they on a round base? Yes. Then no, they can't. Are they on a square base? Yes. Then they can. So... You can even do multi types of basic. Because it's interesting. Do you remove individual models? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so doing a, the, a variation of a of a, a, a three and a two and a one then. Three, is, yeah. yeah. Which is it's just cool because when I've been playing games of this size, like mm. Saga and stuff, I find myself at, at multiple times going, oh, it'd be really cool if I could rank up in this. And I know like games like Sword Point, yes. you can rank up you and break rank, apart and stuff yeah. like that. So. I was just wondering, do, but does it? You've played this game, yes. In at historic on, did you mm. guys go in and out of ranked up formations? Did it slow yeah. the game down, no. or did it keep no, no. going you, along at a good pace? It keeps going at a good pace. The the thing about this is, they are war bands. These are foraging parties, small skirmish groups. They're you know you're not looking at these are not whole armies. These yeah. are representative of small so encounters. When, so, so when they mm -hmm. form up, it's for the likes of a shield wall and, and stuff. Yeah. So even though, let's let's take. Greeks, for example, forming phalanxes, which were typically hundreds of men. Mm -hmm. You don't form a phalanx. You're essentially just forming a shield wall. Yes, these super elite troops may have been trained in how to form phalanxes or how to form manipulative formations, whatever it is, but they're not doing it now. They are essentially just squaring up with their friends to get a bit more protection. Mm -hmm. And it slows you down. You don't move as quickly as people who aren't in a formation because you're having to move in lockstep. You're having to keep the shields together and you can break apart at any time. That's up to you. So yes, forming up takes a little bit, yeah. but then breaking apart at any stage is, is up to you. If, if if those pesky skirmishers are within range in some I have rocks, another question. you can just break and go after them. So looking at it on the tabletop, mm. six by four? Yeah, if, well, anything from... Um, four by four I, I, is the kind of recommended yeah. one. Yeah, and, exactly. Anything from like a three by four... Saga well, style. Can I up play with a, a 40k kind of size of a game in this? People have been doing their level best to try and break it by playing as big. You know, I, the stuff I painted a while ago yeah. for it um, was probably about a third more figures than I needed. Uh -huh. But people have been playing with two or three times that. So instead of going, I'm playing with 30 guys, 
they're going, I'm playing with 100 men. And, and it, it works. And it's working, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, God. Yeah. We have oh, me we, we have a PDF preview. I so it's I not do, the finished yeah. document, but we do have a preview of the rulebook because uh, essentially yeah. the Kickstarter mostly revolves around, I believe, yeah. you know, getting the rulebook in, in, in it, to be in a reality. Yeah. So they are they are funded for the book. The book is going ahead, and yeah. they are currently looking at they're shipping from America. Vetrix, I think, are going to be shipping for Europe and the UK, mm-hmm. and they're trying to find a shipping hub in Australia because they want to get it into people's hands as easily as possible yeah. without having to go, you're having to ship this from uh, parts foreign. Um, in fact, that's the one I'm after there. So it is going ahead. It will be available in all good retail stores that can get it. And if not, there will be hopefully a shipping hub close to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but they've done beautiful work so far. This is not the final version that's yeah. going to be going out. This is very close to the final version. They're going sort of through final proofreading at the moment. Mm-hmm. But they have a really nice um, way that they've been working through the actual book, uh, getting it illustrated and getting the, the sort of the mechanics out there um, as easily as possible. So uh, there's, uh, I can't remember his name, I'm fairly certain he's a Russian artist has been doing all this sort of um, illustration work for them. Now, th- it. now this yeah. PDF just landed moments before we come in to film. Yeah, so so. Uh, so this is slightly different from the one that I'm familiar with, and yeah. it's it's changed a bit. But uh, but the layout's beautiful. I mean, because they've been going through all the way to get these really nice illustrations. Well, let's let's see further on. Yeah, so we got some nice photos and things. Teddy bear fur. <laughs> <laughs> they've, 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 they've been doing some absolutely stunning. Have a wee scroll there, Jerry. Oh, yeah. yeah, here we go. So there we've got the uh, the sequence of play. Yeah. So strategy phase. Um, so strategy phase is where you're sort of working out what your command points is. So you've got heroes on the board and your heroes are your commanders who have command points that they can use to bolster uh, the units around them um, to get them to do bits and pieces. So you need to have that sort of command and control in place. Then you're activating individual units and you don't have to activate everybody and everybody doesn't have to activate to the maximum, which is good because you can use your activations to interrupt your opponent's activations oh, if you've kept them. So if you keep them. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, it means you can burn off fatigue with unused activations as well. So doing everything in one turn is a great way of... Tiring out your army. Tiring out your army. You, can, you could do it in in one phase with one unit and actually hammer the ever-living bejesus out of your opponent because you've done it. Mm-hmm. You can you can spot that weak spot and go, well, if I push now with these couple of units, I can exploit that. He's overextended. Mm-hmm. I'll be able to do them. The next turn, they're way out there, cut off from the rest of their friends, but maybe that's what you've needed to do to you actually... You would need to make it count. Yeah, yeah. It is possible to do it. So yeah. hero moments... Are very much in Absolutely there. Yeah. a possibility of this. That, that's another question answered. Mm. Um, and it's really, it's not about rolling buckets of dice all the time. You can measure at any stage and because you don't have base, um, um, basing requirements, you're not worried about the basing. You can set up, you, you need to explore the tactics of your, your army. So javelin ears, you know that you can move back and still fire. You know that you can move forward. You've got that threat mm-hmm. range. So, um, it comes down to how you control your war band on the tabletop as to how things actually progress. You're not going to be caught out by a charge unless you were stupid enough to push somebody out too far where they could be hit by a charge. Yeah. You should know those like infantry are going to be in a position or those cavalry are going to be in a position where they're going to be charged next turn. It's up to you to make sure they don't get charged, either pull them back or push somebody else out to support them. And having these units supporting each other in a mutual fashion is the best way because if somebody gets in behind you or starts rolling up your flank, you'll you'll feel it sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. But they've done an absolutely, for essentially two brothers who just wanted to, they were raised on Warhammer. They've been massive fans of wargaming for years and going, we really want to put a game out there. Mm -hmm. It's like that. Everybody's got a book in them. Everybody has a game in them. In this case, everybody's Mm -hmm. got a game in them. And this has been an absolute labor of love from them. To get it out there and, and get uh, loving it, get into people's hands. So, um, let me recap then. So, bases don't matter. Nope. Um, you could uh, you can start this quite small, but you could end up a forty k level That's of cool. games yeah. and stuff, no problem at all. 
Very much so, yeah. Um, it's uh, it, it's got heroic moments and all baked in. So if you spot an opportunity mm. and you have the activations to do it, you could have a, a unit go on a complete rampage yeah. uh, off the back of that. What sets it apart then, Jerry? If you had to sum it up in a nutshell, um, what, what, what would set this apart from the sagas and the the other the other games that are out there at the moment? I think it's it's a mixture of the command and control and the realism. So Saga has an interest in command and control with the dice mechanic, mm -hmm. but you really it's very random. You yes. don't have whenever you start the turn, you don't know what's going to be able to activate until you roll those dice. Mm -hmm. Um SPQR is very hero hammer and lots of dice, buckets of dice, uh, but doesn't have a command and control feature. Everybody always gets to activate and everybody gets to do what they want. Mm -hmm. This comes in between the pair of them where you've got that feeling of tactics and maneuver, but it's down to you and exploiting it and working out what you can do and what you can't do, realizing where you are overextending and pulling it back. Um, and the system works so beautifully. It, from the initial deployment phase where you are uh, essentially scouting two forces, you against your opponent in a very, in a sort of a um, chain of command kind of way. You don't put your forces on the table in deployment. You use tokens or cards or an individual mm -hmm. figure to lock down units and then you reveal what those units are. And some of those units mm -hmm. could be scouts and aren't placed on the table at all. So somebody may have seen you sneaking on the left-hand flank off with this one little token or one unit go moving into some forests and they've moved two units across to block you. And then it turns out that that's actually scouts who don't take any part in the battle at all. Oh. And they've got two units away, miles away from the rest of the fight. And then all your fighting is done on the right instead. And by the time they get back over, they're lamped. Yes. And it's these sort of interplays from, from the simple style of deployment all the way through the game. It's all about your tactics and what are you doing and how are you how are you imposing your will on the battle against your opponent? Right. I have a list of army lists. Yes. So the first few army lists include, get this, Roman Republic, mm. Carthaginians, Lowland Gallic tribes, mm -hmm. Highland Gallic tribes, Greek colonies, Iberians, Lusitanians, uh, Celtiberians, <laughs> Italian hill tribes, Italian lowland tribes, Numidians, and Macedonian exhibition. Expedition. Yeah. Expedition. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, so oh, they've, they've, it's massive already. But that, and that's a very small geographic focus and a very small um, period as well. They've, they're mostly going around the sort of the Punic Wars and the, the fighting that was going in that point. Yeah. They have plans to expand it beyond that. Um, what they've been talking about at the moment is at least three more books coming depending mm -hmm. on the success of this, which will be a um, early imperial Roman. So you're, you're, you're the, the standard Hollywood Romans that people know. Yes. Uh, that first sort of century AD type of Roman fellas kicking off. And then the people they fought with, so your um, British, your Gallic, French, mm -hmm. all of these sort of these periods and, and this where it's, it's that sort of period after Carthage um, and then also they can go into the Dark Ages so the Vikings the the Saga Warbands the Dark Age whoever you want the Normans and, yeah. and Bretons and all of these things um, and they also want to do a campaign book but because they haven't worked out what the actual order they will do these things in you've got people who are going well the system seems great I really enjoy the system but maybe I'm not particularly keen on the Punic Wars, mm -hmm. and I'd much rather see um, Imperial Romans against the the, the Gauls. I'd, yeah. I'd much rather see early Imperial Romans against Germans. I want to redo the Chitterberg Forest or whatever happens to be. Mm. So when they launch, they've said that they're actually going to launch with, here's the rule book, and then here are army lists that we've done that aren't playtested, because these army lists have been playtested and balanced very keenly, which mm -hmm. is why it's such a narrow band. They haven't tried to do 800 years and, yeah. and several continents in one go. They've gone, here is the armies that would have fought against each other, and they are balanced against each other. Now, they're also going to release the lists for the other periods that aren't balanced, 
and you can use those and the points value so you can construct your own lists mm -hmm. and your own war bands if you want to go and start doing the bit of history if you want to go what did the irish actually use in the dark ages they use this and this what did the picks use they use this okay well I, this seems a reasonable points cost and, and do the bit of the footwork yourself to make these things balance out and they'll tide you over until the guys get back to it. So they may decide to do the campaign book next, which yeah. I think would be better if they did the campaign book mm -hmm. and give people the get you by lists for the other periods yeah. rather than do another period and another period and then do the campaign. Um, I think if they if they do that, but they might choose, they, they may be further ahead with the Imperial Roman period book than I know. So they may decide to do that next. Well, there's, we'll it, I've just kind of that up. It's 12 factions or something like that covered at the yeah, minute. Yeah, 12 lists, yeah. 12, 12 lists, lists in there, yeah. Is there scenarios and stuff in the book? There are a ton of scenarios in the book. I think there's nine or ten in there at least. Can you flip um, down I, in the PDF I, and see if I you will, can find one? I will flip down and Because I know one. one of the things, like, it's great to get into a game, but if you get into a game and you've got no scenarios to play, because I know that's kind of what happened with the Saga 2.0 came yeah. out. It came and out, we, we were had sitting a around year. for ages waiting for some scenarios to come yeah. out. Mm -hmm. And it got really annoying. <laughs> So I just want to make sure, yeah, the scenarios in the book and you get up and running. Because it's like, there's no point having the lists and, and then you're sitting there going, oh, we're trying to make up all our games. No. Yeah, and, and these games aren't balanced and therefore we're having to spend a lot of time playing yeah. a game and then going, oh, Rabbit. that that would have been good if we'd done this instead. That, yeah, would have, yeah. that would have been good if we'd changed your lists. So um, scenario section, there is indeed. They have six scenarios to begin with. So from This Is My Land and Foraging Duty with terrain variations as well. Oh, there's some people going through, oh, there's an elephant chucking somebody off a, a mountain. I'm going to go out and let and say Hannibal crossing the Alps there. <laughs> uh, and fate points. Yeah, so they've even got things like consulting the omens. This is stuff I didn't get into when I was playtesting it and poking around with the game because I've been having some fun with it. Yeah. Um, but being able to give a rousing speech to your men before you play. So the speech is inspiring and you gain fate points. So fate points are kind of like the Warhammer fantasy, you know, fate points of old where you fluffed a roll terribly, you've got one fate point to spend on your game, have a free reroll, don't don't mess it up again. Yes. It's, it's that, I've, I'm just about to win moment and I've fluffed my roll. I, I have I, I, an option you know, to bring it back yet. Yeah, that, again. that, that yeah. anything but a one roll on one dice. Mm -hmm. If you've done it twice in a row, then clearly you've annoyed the fates and you deserve yes. whatever you get. Um, knight missions dawn or dusk so it reduces the range and cover so there's a small amount of scenarios but there's enough variation between fate time of day and weather conditions and that sort of thing to mix it up to mix it up as well mm -hmm. and see how things change well guys mm -hmm. uh 19 days left for clash of spears well worth watching if you're into your historical kind of ancient well, no it's not ancient it's, 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 well this well, one is this is yeah. ancient. this will run ancients onwards yeah. so well, yeah historical ancients if you're into yeah. that this is one definitely worth going and checking out ben we have some yes. pulp mm -hmm. what's the next kickstarter so uh, as well as that historical side we've also got some awesome stuff from the guys at crooked dice who always do something and a little bit off the wall and crazy and they always seem to plumb the depths of what we loved from back in the annals of history and bring it back to the fore for use in 7TV. And so that's definitely the case here with their Pulp, Sci-Fi Heroes and Villains Kickstarter, which is another one in their series of very lucrative uh, fundraisers, where they're bringing together some characters that may look quite familiar if you like, you know, I, I don't know, Flash Gordon, for oh, example, yes. or something like that. That's that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm starting to recognize yeah. things now, yeah. Yeah so, this is a, yeah, so this is a whole bunch of awesome characters and stuff that you can use in TV games. It's all based on their idea of you know the different characters that you can play in the in the show obviously done by actors in their kind of games but you could also take this beyond seven tv if you wanted and use it for some sort of pulpy role-playing games and skirmish games and all kind of things like that they've got a whole bunch of new characters that they've been sculpting up for the game that as you can tell are slightly based on something that you may know but done a little bit of a different style here and there just to give it that kind of seven tv crooked dice flair and, and difference to it i love the guy obviously the winged leader with mm. his massive mace in his hands you know he's going to be bellowing on the battlefield and that kind of thing as well yeah on top of the on top of the different characters they've also got a whole bunch of different um, villains and sort of like um, mooks and goons in there too so they've got a whole bunch of guys with their ray guns or take on, Go back on the, the heroes and stuff because i think ben's talking about hold on ben one second there oh, you go okay. villains yeah but as well as all the characters and the troops and that kind of thing 
they've also got some really nice things that they've thrown in in terms of terrain and that kind of stuff too and also some big dudes as well so one of the big ones they've added into this campaign that hopefully you'll be able to see as you scroll down is the arena beast so if you want your heroes to be fighting against a massive alien creature on the tabletop then you've got that option there too and there's a whole bunch of extra bits and pieces that you can throw into the mix all done by ernst divine guard who has done the amazing sculpting across all of this range which looks absolutely fantastic uh, and yeah so yeah i'm expecting to see people picking these up painting them in some luridly bright colors as you might imagine from the period and uh, bringing these to the tabletop to show off and get stuck into your games with 7 tv and that kind of thing so there you go there you have it oh oh oh, oh, oh a giant, a robot. giant robot he's awesome <laughs> he's awesome i'm thinking okay, guys. i'm thinking i'm liking the guys in the robes that worry go back up to the guys with the ray guns and the robes for a sec no no further up because i quite up. like that because there's like a guy them. screaming cali mar right in the middle just beside <laughs> dr jones no time for love mm-hmm Keep Some going. I think those, they, those, I think guys, those yeah. guys are my favourites out of this. The, the mole men looking fellas. Yeah, they, yeah. they look like they have just got hand-me-down World War II gas masks that were bought on the <laughs> surplus yes. by L Street Studios. And they just went, yeah, you wear these now. And that will make you monsters. Yep. That's cool. Okay, guys, that wraps that up. Eight days left for the pulp sci-fi heroes and villains from Crooked Dice. Um, uh, once again... Thank you very much, guys, for watching. A big thank you to Jerry, to Ben, and to Lloyd for joining me this morning and touring through the world that is the most magnificent world. It's the gaming world. Right. That's us for this week. Hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow over for XLBS over on ontabletop.com. We've got some... What are we going to talk about tomorrow? We'll talk some hobbies and uh, stuff yeah. tomorrow. Oh, I know what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. I have a plan. I have a secret Christmas gaming plan. I'd like to tell you about it tomorrow. Right. Until then, dudes, happy gaming. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.